We are calling to order the meeting for the Arlington Select Board for Monday, January 25th, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes, thank you. Joe Carl? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. And Len Diggins? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdeling? Yes. Douglas Heim? Yes. And for the first time, we get to call on our board administrator. Board administrator, Ashley Marr? Yes. All right, good, good evening. This meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be able may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for our participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. And we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless it's share notes otherwise. We're now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain agenda items. After members have spoken, I as the chair will afford the public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has the, a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call vote. Let's see if you can give me one moment. All right, so we're gonna take first, we have an emergency addendum that was posted, all right, and this is actually, so Attorney Heim, the emergency addendum, this was item was added to the consent agenda. Can we take this with the rest of the consent agenda? Yes. Okay. All right, so with that, take that up when we go to our consent agenda on the next few items down. So the first item is our fiscal year 2021 quarterly budget update. Sandy Pooler, our deputy town manager, and Ida Cody, our comptroller. Thank you. 
Andy should be joining us. And... Andy, I don't see Ida. Was Ida joining tonight as well? No, she had uh, a family thing that she had to go out of town, so um, she's not able to attend. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to 2021. As finance director, I've already been in fiscal year 2021 for seven months, so it's not so new to me, but uh, I welcome the opportunity to give you an update as we are six months through our fiscal year. Um, I, just to give you a general sense, overall, the uh, fiscal year I think has been going well. Uh, our spending and our um, revenue are generally in line with the revised estimates that we put forward uh, this year, uh, many of which were down because of COVID um, and some of which are still um, starting to come in at a pace that uh, was somewhat delayed because of the delay in the state government passing its budget. They didn't pass a budget until uh, October and uh, so it means that some of the state revenue that we usually count on has been a little bit late in coming in. Um, this report is as 50% through the year will be, uh, will be somewhat reports I've uh, issued in the past just because uh, there aren't that many accounts that are far off from our 50% target. Um, and the ones that are, um, it's really mostly because of timing issues. So I think the, the overall good news is that our, um, we don't have any extraordinary expenditures because of COVID or any other reasons that have thrown our budget out of whack. There are um, COVID expenses that are covered by the CARES Act. Um, many of those expenses are still in departmental budgets. And you'll see them in the extended printouts with, um, with line items that show them there. Eventually they will move out of the departmental budgets as we get um, the money to us through the CARES Act. Um, but again, um, the CARES Act process has been pushed back and, and delayed somewhat. Originally it was all going to run out and all our spending had to happen by the end of last December. They have pushed that back a year and if, to December of 2021. They have also pushed back the reporting dates, which means pushing back the dates by which we'll get some of that money. Uh, originally, um, it was gonna be th this month, but they have pushed it back until next month. Um, so I feel confident that we will get the money. Um, we're just not getting it as fast as we originally thought we we're going to. So with that overview, I uh, just want to um, go through the memo and highlight the departments, any department that had a variance of 10% or more. Um, and really there are only uh, a few of them and they are all either related to having paid some of their bills up front, such as uh, information technology where they encumbered most of their software licensing fees at the beginning of the year they also had COVID expenses that are still in their expense budgets and will be reallocated out later. Elections is high because we, uh, they basically paid for their two elections uh, so far this year. Um, so we'd expect that to be the case. Facilities as is usually the case is high because uh, they encumber a lot of their expenses. And again, they had COVID related expenses. In public works, uh, same thing they've encumbered all their solid waste collection uh, and have encumbered a lot of their snow and ice control budget. Uh, and to some extent they have COVID expenses or not as much as some of the other departments on a percentage basis. The health department encumbered things like their mosquito control expenses at the beginning of the year. They also have substantial COVID related expenses because of uh, hiring contact tracers and doing a lot of the other COVID protection work. 
Um, but other than that, all the other departments, I think, really are on track in their spending. Um, we have a second category called other, uh, which is debt. Uh, we've paid most of our debt so far this year. That's because in the past we've sold most of our debt in um, November's. And so the payments came due uh, this November. Minuteman, we paid entirely upfront as we did with our pension expenses and our liability insurance, uh, we paid 96% of. Um, we do pay those upfront uh, and we get a discount on that. I'm gonna move right into revenue because that is an area that has been uh, something we've watched very carefully. Um, so uh, our tax collection rate is at 50%, um, which is good. It, it, um, our revenue for the year has been coming in uh, exactly where we expect it to. Um, during the second half of the year, that will bump up a little bit just because um, we will include um, the resets, the actual tax bills to people's bills in, in the third and fourth quarters. And those uh, tend to be a little higher for people. Our motor vehicle excise tax collection rate is at 12%. Again, that's consistent with where we'd expect it to be. Um, in February, we will get information from the Department of Revenue uh, on our third quarter bills. Uh, again, that's where the bulk of them come in. And I'm very curious to see how they come in. Originally, we thought motor vehicle excise uh, taxes would be coming in lower this year than other years. Um, there was some information we heard at the MMA conference last week about how car sales are actually running ahead of previous years, uh, in part because um, some people have moved out of cities and um, therefore had to buy cars uh, and, and fewer people are taking mass transit. Um, so we're keeping our eyes on that. Uh, penalties and interest are uh, penalties for people who pay their taxes late. And uh, we had a substantial payment that covered several years past taxes that came in this, this year. And so that number is up. Um, interestingly, uh, other departmental revenue is up. Our collection rate is 61%. That's largely due to municipal lien certificates, which are things that people have to take out either when they sell their houses or when they refinance. And I think because of the continued low interest rates, people have continued to do that. Licenses and permits are still coming in at a healthy rate. Um, they have uh, been slightly less than the last couple of years, but not significantly off. Um, and again, penalties and in interest, uh, this represented a, uh, excuse me, payments in lieu of taxes. This says penalties in lieu of taxes. That's a, that's a typo and that's my fault, I apologize. Uh, this represents payments uh, from the um, Arlington Housing Authority for uh, multiple years of past pilots uh, all coming in. So that, that's been strong. Uh, the other thing on the next page that I think has been interesting is uh, the hotel tax has come in way over our estimates. We substantially lowered our estimates this year. Uh, we lowered them down to about $50,000. Um, so those have come in much higher than we originally anticipated. Uh, same thing with the meals tax. Again, we lowered those very substantially. Uh, they had been originally $425,000. So the good news is they're coming in over our estimates, which means we will generate some free cash because of this. Um, they are still substantially below um, what we've collected in previous years. And so, um, you know, we just need to be aware of, of that. Uh, interest on investments is coming in strongly. Um, that continues to be good. Uh, and um, fines and forfeitures, those are again, mostly moving violations. Uh, and we have, um, we have adjusted though, we continue to try to adjust those, um, but they do continue to come in a little low because changes in police uh, behavior. Um, I think I'll jump 
right into the enterprise funds unless people want to ask questions about the general fund. All right, thank you. I will keep going then. Um, the enterprise funds, uh, water and sewer uh, has been doing well, both because uh, we had timely water rate increases and because this summer there was a drought. Um, so people use more water. Also more people are home than going into Boston. So they are using more water in Arlington. Um, so I feel very good about water and sewer. AYCC, um, they are expending um, consistent with uh, continued demand for services. Our revenue is behind and that's mostly because of the delay in the passage of the state budget, whereby um, the state has not yet paid us most of uh, the revenue that they owe us during the year. Um, we have been told by asking them that they do intend to send that soon. So I think we will see that catching up in the next month or so. Uh, so I am not worried about that. Um, COA transportation has been down all year because of construction at the um, senior center. And um, I think that just this year, you'll see usage and, and revenue continue to, to stay low. Uh, the Ed Burns uh, rink has expended most of its budget because they are substantially through most of their uh, season. Um, their collection rate is substantially down. Uh, there have been many delays uh, affecting hockey in general and skating in general. Joe Connolly has done a lot of work to try to fill in and rent space out more as, as cancellations come in. Um, but when you have things like a COVID um, quarantine on say the hockey, the high school hockey team, um, we do can and sometimes do get people in right away to fill that, um, but that's not always possible. We also will lose some substantial revenue uh, because the hockey team is not gonna have tournaments um, this winter. Um, they're just play, playing their regular season games. We are looking at that. Joe has some plans to reallocate some of um, the expenses, some of his staff expenses over to recreation just because uh, he and others have spent less time uh, doing rink work this year. Uh, and he has a plan that he thinks will bring um, rink in on budget um, by the end of the year. Uh, we will make those adjustments closer to the end of the year, um, but he does, he has put together a plan and he and I have gone over that. Um, and finally, recreation has had substantially fewer uh, expenditures this year, just because of the many pro programs we have not run. Uh, and Joe has talked to me about the anticipating that in the spring, we will be able to sign uh, people up for things like the res and uh, certain summer programs as um, COVID vaccination goes forward. Um, that remains to be seen exactly how much um, will happen, but uh, because uh, a lot of our expenses in recreation are for non-staff um, teachers and trainers and so forth who come in and we just pay them for the courses they teach. Both our collections and our expenses have been down. Um, again, I think Joe has been doing an excellent job of monitoring that. At this point, I'm not, I don't see a, a major problem with the recreation fund. Um, it has a relatively good balance, um, but we do need to continue to watch it and see how they were able to sign people up in the fall, in the, excuse me, in the spring uh, for summer programs when they, they take in a fair amount of revenue before the start of the summer. Uh, that is my report at this point. Um, it is a lengthy, there are lengthy uh, other documents, uh, summaries here of our revenue and expenses by department, uh, by those other categories I talked about, um, by uh, the warrant articles and by, um, the enterprise funds. At this point, I, I think I will conclude re my remarks and would be happy to answer any questions members of the board have. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. And I did forget to mention this before at the start of the meeting, if I can just jump in for a second. We are test, we're piloting a new transcription service for this meeting that will help generate um, 
written minutes of the of what's said during the meeting. So everyone speak clearly. We get to see what really comes out of our mouths. So <laughs> so that will be available and the town manager can speak later if you want to on how to access that. All right, with that, I will turn to the board for any questions, comments for Mr. Cooler, Mr. Carl. Thank you very much. That, this is this is always incredibly helpful. So I really appreciate these reports every quarter. Um, I just had one question. I, I guess somehow I, I never realized that the Arlington Housing Authority pays us a pilot. Um, how is that amount? I, I know it's it's not it's not huge, but how is that amount computed? Is it somehow matched to a particular service that the town provides to um, AHA or is it just just by by precedent? Um, I think it is a, uh, I, I don't, I have not been involved in, in those discussions with the housing board. I can say generally, uh, when my experience in other communities, there is a, a value based on the value of the property. Um, but, um, uh, further than that, I, I don't have any details. I'm sorry. No, no worries. Th thank you very much. Yeah. I, I have no further questions. This is Mahan. Sorry, I thought I was on mute before. <laughs> I was clearing my throat. I apologize. Um, I have a, just a few questions. Um, I understand this is reporting as of the end of the second quarter of the fiscal um, 20 or 21? 21. Um, 21. Um, meaning that we're sort of creeping into the, the third quarter. Um, my, I have several questions, questions through the chair um last year we took a vote that i can't remember if it was property taxes the water bill and or both that we took a vote that up until june 30th you sort of had a grace period um and as long as you paid your act actual tax bill um you wouldn't be accrued the interest on that um going forward so Hopefully someone's going to remember what what it is I'm talking about. And my question is, is that something we need to revote or did we vote that so it covers this year? Um, that was a one time thing that we did because of uh, COVID and because of this the massive disruptions to people's pocketbooks and checkbooks last spring. Um, we generally had those payments and Frank, most of them did come in on, on on their usual schedule as it is. Um, I will also say that in my experience, I have not heard of other communities trying to um, bringing that idea forward this year, just for comparison. Um, and uh, people have been paying both their water and, um, and tax bills on schedule this year. We don't, we don't have huge delinquencies. Um, so just to give you some perspective. Okay, and I, and I only say that because while, while I did not attend, um, I do read the Mass Municipal Association, MMA, weekly um, newsletters that come out where it says that communities may want to consider renewing do, doing that, um, which I understand what um, the Deputy Town Manager said that um, people were not delinquent, but what it was was saying you have up until June 30th um to pay your actual tax bill again i'm not clear if it was property and or water bill tax bill um and the mma was suggesting that that's something cities and towns probably should consider doing again so i would ask the chairman mr hurd um and i don't know if mr chaplain has any comment on this um but that's where i read it <laughs> it was from the mma saying that that's something that cities and towns should consider doing again so if nobody has a comment, that's fine. I'll move on to my next question. But if the chair, would, Mr. Chapdelaine does. Yeah, I, I would just quickly add, I, I believe the legislature would need to act again to allow it. I think it was a one-time statutory allowance. Um, so I, I can, we can certainly verify that. Um, and I, as uh, Sandy mentioned, I've not heard that the legislature is considering such a measure again, but we can certainly look into it. And if it seems appropriate, bring it back before the board. That would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. And if you could just- I, like I, to it. It. And I don't think there was, there was nothing specific about the fourth quarter when we did it last, other than the fact that that was the next quarter that came up. 
from when the state of emer emergency was declared. That's true. That is correct. Okay, I, I just wanted to put on everyone's radar that sure. um, if we we're going to do that again this year, as the chair and the town manager stated, uh, our legislative delegation and others um, need to redo that process from last year because I think we're still in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, the other um, question I have is in terms of the areas or revenue that are producing more than we lowballed, and I don't mean to say that in a bad way, like hotels, meals, and invest, investment, as well as um, our allocation to the school side of the budget um, based on enrollment numbers, uh, am I correct that that is sort of being tracked, and I missed the last meeting, I had it January 14th, that's being tracked by the Long Range Planning Committee. And my question is, are those areas being compiled as well as being projected to either send funds back to the general fund or send funds back to general fund and reallocate to other areas. Um, I don't know if Mr. DeCourcy, I believe you, I, I know you're chair of long range planning or Mr. Hurd, the chairman or, or the town manager or all of the above can sort of speak to that. Mr. Cooler. Um, I, I would just start by saying that we've had ongoing conversations uh, around the school spending about what their spending rate is this year and uh, what, if any, um, surpluses they will have. Um, there are, on, part of those ongoing questions are whether they will then return uh, money back to the general fund at the end of the year and or whether they will um, prepay some of their expenses for next year, such as, um, such as they did this year with their, some of their SPED expenses, which they can pay before June 30th. Um, there's been no decision about on either the school department side or with the long range planning side, as far as I'm aware of how those exactly will be finished, uh, finished this year. I do believe um, the school department from my conversations with them have been tracking their expenditures. Um, I know that there are some areas where they have not been able to spend all their budget because they haven't been able to uh, hire as many people as they originally thought they were going to. Um, and so I think we're curious to, to see how those numbers come out. Um, in terms of some of the other things that you asked about, um, in terms of our other revenue coming in, uh, I would just say, yes, we are uh, keeping the Long Range Planning Committee aware of some of these surpluses. Um, as I said, both hotel tax and meals tax are right now the two big ones that we've been looking at. They've come in over revenue, but they're also hundreds of thousands of dollars short and will be hundreds of thousands of dollars short of where they usually come in. Um, so we have kept the committee aware of that so they understand what our financial position is. And if there are any other questions about that, I'd be happy to answer. Ms. Mann? Um, okay, I, I think, um, unless Mr. DeCourcy has something to add, I guess this will be more discussed in long range planning, but one of the, uh, sorry, I'm clicking my pen. One of the things that has, has already been struck in my car or whatever, however you want to say it, having had, severely special needs daughter who is now 28. So I'm six years out of the system. Um, the special education part of the school budget, which we as members of the select board um, don't have any direct involvement in, that seems to sort of be the, um, besides the enrollment numbers, which I have concerns about. Um, and the reason I have concerns is I'm hearing about a 2025 override, which I think is just something that most people I talk to in town are just really blown back by um, given the current situation. So you need to look at um, other areas. That's why I brought up about hotels, meals, investments, um, uh, projected producing more. Is that being reapplied um, to the general fund? But 
the other issue I have is I understand what the deputy town manager is reporting from what he's hearing from the school side reporting, but a large part of the school budget is special education. Um, those truly severe um, children of special education that incur the most debt have not been receiving any of those services, which are in person. And so all that money is um, not being spent. So I guess uh, unless I hear differently, I should look to the long range planning committee um, for further joint discussions on that, unless anyone has anything they can add to that. Did you have anything from the January long, long range planning meeting that touches on this? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just want to say a couple things to the, the, the questions uh, Mrs. Mahan raised. And I think some of this is going to be addressed in the um, the town manager's budget presentation in terms of what some of the planning is, is being done for next year, particularly with respect to enrollment and, and also addressing what the challenges are and, and, and the uncertainties. And there certainly have been discussions at, at long range planning and there, there are discussions taking place between the meetings, but there's no um, clear path right now that, that could be presented this evening. But I think in terms of some of the discussions between town and school and, and some of the budgeting considerations, I think that is going to be addressed by the manager in the next in the next section. That, that, that is correct, Mr. Chair and Mr. DeCourcy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. All right, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Pooler, for the presentation. Um, I did have on my list as well the, the real estate tax issue that Mrs. Mahan raised. And, and I realized that the legislature would have to take action. And, and we were concerned last year um, about not extending the payment deadline date, but, but waiving interest through June 30th. And if people weren't able to pay by June 30th, then the interest uh, waiver would go away. And, and I, I thought that worked well. And I hope the legislature does offer that at least um, for the period between May 2nd and June 30th, because we don't necessarily budget for the 14% the interest that people incur for late payments of real estate tax. And if we get the money by the end of the year, we're made whole on our real estate taxes. And I think there is still remaining uncertainty. So I think it's something we probably have to talk about with our delegation. It sounds like it has been discussed um, somewhat limited across the state, but I thought that program was, was helpful as a compassionate program. Um, so I, I hope it can be done again. Um, on the page here that's on the screen, Mr. Pooler, um, there's a line of 121,000 for tax liens. I may have missed it when you spoke about it earlier, but what, what is in, included there um, that um, you know, we, we typically haven't seen uh, in the past? Um, so it is an unbudgeted, first of all, it's, it's not a budgeted revenue source because year to year, we don't know what um, liens are gonna be redeemed because of uh, sale of property or people paying off their, their taxes. So um, I just wanna say that's why you may not have seen it so much in the past or may not have been reported in the past. Um, so it is just whatever liens uh, we have on um, property when, when people pay off their past taxes if there are, are other liens uh, from the town that are associated with those properties, uh, whether it be water or sewer or other things, um, they, uh, they come in in this category. Okay, thank you. And, and on the revenues, um, and I don't know if it's still too early, but um, are we starting to see some revenues from sales at Apotheca? It has not been reported yet. Okay. I, I, I've been looking for them. But, okay. um, and I've been asking about them, but we have not had that revenue come into the general fund yet. Okay. And then just a question on the COVID related expenses. And I, I, I see the, the discussion on the, um, the health department and, and it's great to see that there'll be reimbursements at the end of 2021. Are there other departments besides health um, in particular that have had particular COVID related expenses or is that more spread out across the town once you get past the health department? Um, I would say in particular, uh, the library has had expenses as has the facilities department. 
to some extent, DPW, uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, police and a lesser extent, fire. Those are, oh, and, and then through uh, the election process, uh, we had some expenses related, related there. All the other departments pretty much have been just running, uh, people have been working, uh, either working from home or coming into town hall. Uh, we have not had to incur a lot of uh, major expenses through uh, other departments for, for COVID related things. If, if there's been any PPE or barriers that we've put up, those have all shown up in the facilities department budget. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I agree with everyone else. I mean, um, it's a great report, Sandy, and happy to um, have it. Uh, just a couple of short questions. I mean, one is going to follow up on um, Mr. Kuro because, I mean, the AHA payment kind of caught my attention. So, um, so um, any explanation for why um, they were behind and, and why they need to do the, the um, multi-year payment all at once? Um, I do know... <laughs> I, I will have to say, I tried to find that out myself and contacted A A HA. Um, I did not hear back. Okay, that's um, fine. So uh, right. no, I, that's once fine. I get further information, I'd be glad to pass it along. Yeah, you know, I'm just more, more so curious than anything else. I mean, uh, uh, I'm happy to say in a sense that um, this, um, this you know, select board has made me like more aware of HA you know, and, and and the, the, the good work that they do. And so I, Mr. Kuro raised it and thought I would follow up on it a little bit more. Um, as the second one, um, cause I'm a transit guy, transportation guy, the blue bikes, I mean a hundred, um, what's going on with that? I mean, uh, they are quite a bit above budget. It, um, it's like uh, 22,000 versus 20,000 expenditure year to date. Um. That one, actually, I have to say, I did not pay, pay that much attention to what that encumbrance is. Yeah. Uh, I, I will inquire of uh, the planning department in January, and I will follow up with an email to the board uh, to let you know. Yeah, sure, sure, no problem. And, um, and just a kind of general question. So um, and I know we pay attention to usually stuff that is above budget, but of the stuff that's coming in way below budget, Hey, are you seeing any kind of like warning signs and things that are below budget? I mean, a lot of stuff is COVID related, but but are you like getting any sense of, of maybe some long-term impairment or whatever I mean, from things that are lower than expected for a prolonged period? It just- um, I would, I think the short answer is no. I don't see anything. I mean, I again, there are some areas, particularly in the revenue side, like meals tax, that are just way lower than they've been in past years. And uh, in our forecast, we knew that we lowered them and then we built them up over time in the, in the future, anticipating that they will not return immediately. Um, and I think you can see just yourself that there are many restaurants in town that are not open now or, uh, or have just closed permanently. And I think it will take several years for that to, to rebound. Um, other things uh, have not really dropped off in a substantial way. I, I was worried at the beginning of the year about our licenses and permits, but there's a lot of work going on in town. So that does not worry me. Um, it is interesting that um, cemetery revenue is down. There are fewer burials. I don't know exactly why that is, but I suspect to some extent that if people may be putting off those ceremonies until they can reconvene again. Um, so there, I don't think that is a fundamental change in behavior as much as it's a timing issue. So we are looking at those things and, and try to be aware of them. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Then my main question, Mr. DeCourcy had already touched on this and got an answer, but was more to the the Apotheca reven uh, tax revenue that we're anticipating. Do you know when we'll see that? Or is it, do you have any idea when that will start being available to the public? Um, I frankly 
don't know. I just see it when the state sends it to us and yeah. I've not been involved with Apotheca directly. I just look at what the state sends us. Is that something that gets collected on an ongoing basis or is it at the end of the year? Um, I, I, I believe and I assume that we will get quarterly payments as we do with some of our other, uh, like our, our, our other taxes, mm -hmm. but meals tax and hotel motel tax that they're paid um, through the state um, and then come to us. But I don't know when we will actually start getting those from the state. And thank you for the report. This is always very helpful to cut into the numbers and look at where we are with revenues. This is a great thing that we've been able to do over the past couple of years. I will say on Ed Burns, things are looking up a little bit. They expanded the hours. So men's hockey's back. I'm back on the ice tomorrow. So we'll have a little bit more each week. So get that number up a little bit. All right. And so with that, I think I don't think we have any more questions. We have a motion to receive. So moved. By Mr. Carl, seconded by. Second. Mr. DeCourcy, Attorney Hennig. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, but I found one question that I failed to ask that I think is a quick answer, Mr. Chair, if I could. Yes. Um, under the three quarters, approximately three quarters of a million dollars under salary reserve, is that, um, I think I know the answer, So, but I'm gonna ask both questions. Is that sort of something pro forma that we put in there or is that because of at least one uh, union group contract um, that is an arbitration or a combination thereof? Uh it is because of the one contract that is un unsettled. We have set aside sufficient funds, we think, to be able to settle that contract un under a reasonable um, arbitration award. And that's what that money is for. Okay, it's my understanding um, that that is the uh, Patrolman's Association, but I could be wrong on that. And I'm not saying that that's something we will be awarding, but I think that's the one that's outstanding right now. You're absolutely correct. Um, we have briefs have gone into the uh, arbitrator and um, there's a little back and forth now and we're waiting for a decision from the arbitrator. Okay, thank you. So yes, thank you, Attorney Hahn. Uh, you're still muted, Doug. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Uh, Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Pooler. Thank you. That item number three on our agenda, fiscal year 2022 town manager's budget presentation. Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if Sandy's willing, I'll ask him to stay since he might be able to assist me in answering uh, some of the questions that may follow this presentation. Uh, I'll also say uh, sort of in, in closing Sandy's presentation that Sandy reminded me this morning that He's actually celebrating his uh, fifth year anniversary working for the town. So it's gone by, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's gone by fast for him, but I think it's, it's gone by fast. I can't believe he's been here this long, but he uh, continues to be a, an awesome contributor. So I'm uh, glad, he's, glad he's here tonight. Absolutely. Um, I'll continue uh, praising Sandy and saying the FY22 budget, uh, which the board knows was provided uh, to board members on January 15th per the requirements of the Town Manager Act. Uh, is the product of a great deal of work uh, put forth really uh, in a focused effort by Sandy Pooler as deputy town manager and Julie Wayman as management analyst. And then more broadly, a lot of work on the part of all the department heads and their staff providing Sandy and Julie and myself all the data we need to be able to put together uh, the budget on an annual basis. Uh, normally, over the past few years, I've put together uh, a PowerPoint presentation that has followed a very similar uh, format because the way we normally do budgeting here is on a year-over-year -year basis that makes things easy to compare and think about in a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, this year, given the circumstances and the environment that we're operating under due to COVID-19, is really a budget year unlike any that I've been uh, in Arlington or really working anywhere for. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to talk to you tonight about really the key points in regards to this budget and highlight the fact that more than usually, 
This is a budget I think we'll continue to talk about this spring as we learn more about both the governor's budget, the legislative budget, and also what the economic outlook is uh, as we hope to be coming out of the pandemic as vaccinations roll out. So tonight I wanna to talk a little bit about that uncertainty. Uh, I wanna frame up how we've been thinking about the school budget. Uh, I think I'll answer uh, at least partially, hopefully mostly the questions that Ms. Mahan asked about how we're thinking about school budgeting and Mr. DeCourcy alluded to this as well. I wanna talk about how we're viewing the town budget a little differently than we viewed it in years past. And I do wanna address the long range outlook uh, that Ms. Mahan asked about in terms of how we're thinking about, or at least when we're projecting uh, when an, another override uh, would need to be contemplated uh, or considered. So to start with the uncertainty, uh, as the board knows, we budget as part of a long range plan. Uh, now we're now in the middle of the four year plan uh, that was approved uh, several years ago now uh, with the override two years ago. And normally we budget very conservatively and we do well by doing that, meaning we, we beat our, uh, our revenue benchmarks, we do better on our expense bench, uh, benchmarks and like the last time around have stretched out the long range plan. Uh, this time, because of the economic impacts of COVID-19 back in 2020, uh, those even though we had still uh, budgeted conservatively, uh, we've not beat those benchmarks in the same manner, and we don't necessarily have that same upside uh, that we've had in past, past years uh, as we look at our long-range plan. Again, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what state aid will look like. Uh, we did get some good news coming out of the MMA annual meeting last week that unrestricted general government aid that we estimated to grow by 1% will grow by 3.5% in the governor's budget, uh, which is about a benefit of approximately $200,000 in revenue that isn't part of the plan that I submitted to the board on January 15th. The governor also stated that uh, his administration would be planning to fully fund the first year of the Student Opportunity Act. In concept, that's a good thing. Uh, we'll know Wednesday what that fully means. We don't exactly know what that means in terms of how they'll be viewing uh, enrollments in various districts. Arlington's not alone in having its enrollment go down. Uh, so we're all very curious to see on Wednesday how the governor will be treating that. And that's a big question mark in terms of how we think about things going forward. More broadly, uh, I think we're rightly hopeful that we are on the way out of this pandemic, uh, that people will start to get vaccinated, the economy will start to move again, uh, and that state revenues and local revenues will look up. Um, not at all to be pessimistic, but there is still a lot of uncertainty about that. Um, under new business, if we have time later tonight, I'll talk a little bit about vaccinations, but there is, as we've seen in the globe almost every day, a lot of concern about how vaccinations are rolling out. So there is uncertainty about you know, exactly whether or not we'll have the type of economic rebound and when we'll have that economic rebound that we're hoping for. So it's for that, it's for these reasons of uncertainty. And I, I guess the other layer of uncertainty that I add is about whether or not enrollment in the school department will rebound in September. I think the board knows we had projected for this current fiscal year to have school enrollment growth of 150 students. Uh, we actually went down uh, by I believe 280, 278 students. Um, so there was a, really a tremendous swing in the enrollment of the district that was not expected. How many of those students come back uh, in September of 2021 uh, is certainly very uncertain. Um, so that's a big question we have too. And all of that has painted how we've thought about the school budget and it's painted how we've thought about the town budget. And then that all impacts how the long range uh, forecast looks for when the next override needs to be considered. So to start with the schools, um, working with Sandy, and then working with Charlie Foskett as chair of the finance committee and Dean Carmen and Christine Deschler, who he has appointed to help him in looking at the school budget and to work with us looking at the school budget. Um, we've put together sort of a conceptual framework for how to view both this current FY, um, uh, current fiscal year budget, excuse me, and next year's fiscal year budget. And that framework is uh, in four parts. One, uh, how are we thinking about the general education budget? Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, there's less students in the district than what we had budgeted for. And what does that mean for how the schools will spend their money this year? Will there be a surplus? If there is, uh, will they use it to pay down out of district tuition for special education costs, or will they turn it back to the general fund? Uh, 
both would have a benefit on the town's bottom line, uh, make no mistake. Uh, but those are issues that are actively being looked at by myself, by Sandy, and most closely by Dean Carmen uh, as the finance committee representative working with the school committee's finance uh, or budget subcommittee. The second piece of that framework is to look at special education. And to some degree, we've cleared up this issue, uh, but there was an important focus on determining whether or not budgeted special education costs were matching up with actual special, uh, special education costs, primarily from a three-year or five-year historical basis, uh, looking to see whether or not the 7% growth year over year is justified. Uh, Sandy's done some work with Mike Mason, the school CFO, and has determined that uh, there's only very little uh, variance between what's been budgeted and what the schools have actually been expending. Uh, so justifying that there doesn't necessarily need to be any level resetting uh, for special education. The third piece of that framework is the school's five-year, uh, school committee's five-year strategic plan, which was uh, in, adopted or included as part of the, this board's override commitments. That was initially supposed to be funded at 600,000, 600,000, 800,000, and 800,000, uh, one, of, one of those numbers for each of the four years of the long range plan. The first year of the override, that 600,000 was funded. This current fiscal year, because of uncertainty, budgetary and otherwise, we reduced the 600 number down to 240. Uh, what the finance committee, and I know I certainly felt this way in Sandy as well, wanted to make sure is that we were, if possible and if desired on the part of the schools, helping them catch up to continue to make those strategic investments that were committed to as part of the override. And then the final piece of the framework was to think about school enrollment growth. For many years now, our school budgets have been driven by how many new students we expected. And we started funding uh, a formula called Growth Factor many years ago at 25% uh, of depart the state's Department of Elementary and Secondary Education per pupil expenditure costs multiplied by the number of new students and allocating that to the schools as a growth factor. A couple of years later, that was bumped up 35%. And then as part of this current long range plan, it was bumped up to 50% of DESE uh, per pupil expenditures. Uh, however, since we're down in enrollment and we don't know how many students are coming back next year, uh, we certainly felt it wouldn't be prudent to put in that growth factor that had been programmed as part of the long range plan before we hit the pandemic and before this enrollment decrease uh, came to be. So taking all of those things um, into consideration, the budget that I submitted on January 15th um, maintains the general education budget plus three and a half percent per the plan, uh, but makes clear that we want to continue that work with the finance committee and the school committee's budget subcommittee to look at what their surpluses are that year and make sure that their decisions um, are go forward in the best interest of the general fund and the town's bottom line. I already mentioned how we're viewing special education. We're continuing that number forward with the 7% growth has been, that has been committed to as part of the long range plan. In terms of the strategic plan implementation, uh, there was a $460,000 uh, gap between what they were supposed to be receiving this year um, and what they did not receive. So we split that in half into two $230,000 chunks and are proposing that to be funded in this upcoming fiscal year, FY22, and then the final piece in FY23. So instead of $800,000 in each of those years, there would be a strategic plan implementation funding of $1,030,000 in each of those fiscal years. And then finally, and this is probably the most consequential piece of what we're recommending, is we're recommending to set aside uh, the just over $1 million growth factor that had been previously budgeted and put it into a special finance committee reserve fund. So it won't be allocated uh, per, if, if our recommendation was to go forward, it wouldn't be allocated um, as part of the normal school budget process. It would be set aside and if enrollment started to go above uh, where it currently is and above what had been projected for this year, the school committee will be able to go back to the finance committee and based on that actual enrollment when we learn it in the fall, uh, attempt to access those funds. So that's it's very unique. Um, it's been deeply discussed, uh, again, internally between me and Sandy with the Finance Committee and the Long Range Planning Committee. And we feel like it's a prudent path forward to both make sure we're, we're properly setting aside money for what could be a return of enrollment, uh, but also not fully committing those funds until we know what the enrollment is. 
Uh, so that is how we're thinking about the school funding strategy. And as I've said, that is something, you know, normally we, we put a number in the sand or we put a yeah, number in the sand now, and that's what it is. Um, this year, because of the uncertainty, um, we're going to continue that work and hope to finalize a number uh, soon before we get to town meeting. In terms of the town budget, for all uh, intents and purposes, this is really a level services budget. Um, again, as the board knows, town budgets are allowed to grow by three and a quarter percent uh, as part of the long range plan. This year, we've submitted a budget uh, at a per percentage lower than that. Uh, I believe we submitted at 2.6%. Um, and again, most of that is uh, representative of a level services budget. Um, there's really only two things that I would say have been added to this budget per se. And then I wanna describe how we've listed a, a set of priorities that we might still want to fund, depending on what the totality of the state budget is um, as we learn more about revenues in the upcoming weeks. The two things I would say that have been uh, legitimately added for this proposal for next year is a continuation of two health compliance officers that we hired as part of the CARES Act funding in this current fiscal year. We will be able to pay for those two health compliance officers for the first half of FY22, but to keep them on after that, the general fund would need to pick it up. Uh, because we're still working our way out of this pandemic and we're not exactly sure what the future holds, uh, we think it's prudent to maintain that investment in public health at least until the end of FY22. So even though those people are on the payroll now, uh, they show up as new in the FY22 budget for that half year because we expect CARES Act to expire at the end of this calendar year. Next, uh, as a continuation of our investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I think the board knows that we've already established uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a division of the Health and Human Services Department. Jill Harvey has been promoted to director of that division. We've hired her administrative help um, in the person of Christina Coleman. Uh, but in the FY22 budget, we're also adding training money to the DEI budget so that Jill and Christina working with the Human Rights Commission, Rainbow Commission and Disability Commission can really start to build out uh, a robust training and education program for both internal and external stakeholders on the important issues of uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. And then finally, I'll say, as I'm sure the board members have seen in the budget proposal, uh, we did set out uh, four positions that we would consider um, asking to be funded, depending exactly on how revenues come in again over the course of the next few weeks. Um, I'll quickly list them. Um, a permitting engineer in public works uh, to help with tracking down uh, mostly road opening permits to make sure that the utilities and contractors are coming back to maintain their pa uh, the patches they put into the road. It's a common complaint that we've received for years. Uh, and have continued to work hard to try to keep up with, but dedicating a resource to that has been something we've been trying to do for a long time. Um, in the inspectional services department, um, we would consider adding a part-time compliance officer. This would be a person whose um, sole responsibility would be the enforcement of the good neighbor agreement and some of the other bylaws um, that the inspectional services division, uh, excuse me, department um, is required uh, to maintain compliance with. So this wouldn't be somebody doing building inspections or wire permits or gas permits. This would be someone solely dedicated to making sure the good neighbor agreement uh, was proactively enforced. This is based on community feedback and definitely something that um, the director of inspectional services would also like to see if possible. We'd consider adding a part-time public records uh, request coordinator. Uh, we continue year over year to see more and more public records requests. Uh, and it, it's become over time quite administratively burdensome. If possible, adding such a position would be something we'd look to do. And then finally, uh, based on continued growth in teen services that need to be provided at the library, based on the number of teens that are coming in and um, availing themselves to teen services, uh, at least pre-pandemic and assumedly post-pandemic, um, we would look at adding a part-time teen services library. I'll have more to report to the Board and Finance Committee in coming weeks in terms of how we're going to view that. But those are um, those are the positions we'd be looking at. So to the last point of the long range plan. So all along um, from the start, this was assumed to be a four year override. And such that in FY24, it was presumed uh, another override would need to be considered. 
um, we had certainly hoped, as I mentioned earlier, that by budgeting revenues conservatively, that we would be able to whittle down that deficit in FY24 and um, make whatever override that could be considered um, something that would be in line with what previous overrides had been. Uh, we've not, that, that again, those revenues have not played out due to the pandemic. So as is included in the budget that was sent to the board last week, you'll see that in FY24, uh, there is a projected $7.5 million deficit increasing to $18 million the next year and $23 million the year after that. Um, without anything changing, passing an override to cover those three deficit years would be much, much larger than anything this town has ever considered or passed before, probably much larger than any community in the whole Commonwealth has passed before. So we are in a period of time where uh, tightening our belts, making sure we're scrutinizing both revenues and expenses is, um, is as important as it's ever been to the town. So we're, we're, we're focused on that through this budget cycle to see what we can do to make that number smaller in FY24. And we'll certainly be looking at it in uh, FY23 as well, because we really only have these next two fiscal years to have that impact. So with all that said, I just wanna reemphasize the unique nature and uncertainty of this budget as it's been put together and as it will be considered going forward. I wanna reemphasize that four part school funding strategy that we've considered, again, with the most consequential piece being holding back the growth factor until we know more about enrollment. The level services town budget, um, attempting to exercise fiscal responsibility while recognizing the importance of investing in both public health and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, the need for us to continue, uh, all of us collectively, to work towards decreasing the deficit that's currently projected for FY24. So I think that concludes everything I wanted to share with the board tonight. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions board members might have. All right, with that, I will turn to Ms. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, sort of a basic question, um, not a sarcastic one. Uh, normally, I, I get the actual budget book by January 15th. And for some reason, I didn't. Am I, am I the only one who didn't get that? I actually don't have one either. Uh, normally by January 15th of every year, um, it's basically either we pick it up at the office, which we wouldn't do or be sent to our house. So I'm, I'm really kind of handicapped by my questions that I probably would ask if I was able to review that. So I, I guess I would ask the town manager. And I, the reason why I didn't call you about this, Mr. Chaplain, was I was just waiting and refreshing um, my novice agenda, thinking maybe it would be there, and then I would ask the office to get me a hard copy. But um, uh, so we, um, I know, uh, def definitely tell me. I know I sent the full electronic copy to all board members on January fifteenth, and in that email, um, told board members that hard copies were being provided to the select board staff, and that they would be arranging to deliver those hard, cop hard copies to the board. I, I physically witnessed Sandy bringing uh, Sandy and Julie bringing those hard copies to the board's office, so uh, they are there. Um, I, I can I will talk with the board's office to figure out what happened there, but they were provided on January fifteenth. Okay, that's fine. You you can pass it on to the select board office, but it's the town manager's responsibility um, to deliver them to us. I'm just trying to defend my office. Um, that's really not fair to say that. Because I have been asking the select board office for it, and you all say you delivered them. Um, I know I, I got something delivered on Friday from the select board office because I asked them to do a hard print, a print copy for me, because uh, my print has been on the whack of, of the agenda materials, and they've done that. So um, I, I'd ask you not to dump that onto the select board office. It's not their responsibility. Uh, so with that, I'm a little handicapped in my questions. Um, Regarding the health compliance officers, did you say they were two part-time people? They are two full-time positions. Two full-time positions at approximately what for salary and then add in the incidentals? Approximately a uh, salary of about $62,000 a year each. And these are people that are right now primarily working as contact tracers for, uh, for the spread of the virus. 
And that's just their base salary. That's not insurance and longevity and everything else included. Uh, that, that's their base salary, correct. All right, so we can pretty much double that. And the reason I'm saying this is, you know, we're, we're talking about the last long range planning committee I was at when we were talking about this exorbitant 2024, 2025 um, override. It really kind of shook me to the core. And um, I know one of the first things is, you know, operate with what you have and hope to carry it through. Um, so I, I would ask the town manager regarding the 62,000, which is 124,000 and pretty much half or three quarters that for uh, benefits, longevity, retirement, things like that. Um, I, I'd like to see exactly what their activities, and I don't know who the people are and if they're people I know and interact with, I apologize, but I, I'd like to exactly know exactly how that is uh, beneficial and um, something we can stand up and say that, that we need to continue in terms of contact, contact tracing. And I'll leave it at that. I know I have something I could say more on that, but I won't. Um, I, I understand the um, permitting, per, permitting engineer um, through the inspectional um, services department. Um, I believe again, you said it was part-time. What, what would the salary be? So the permitting engineer position is the only uh, one of those that we talked about being a full-time position. So that would be approximately a $70,000 a year position. Uh, I would, I wanna reiterate, that is what we've sort of put on what I'm calling a waiting list. It's not currently being proposed. It's something that if revenues from the state are better than what we're expecting, we may consider proposing, um, but it's not something that is currently part of the recommendation. Okay, um, and again, because I don't have the budget book, I, I would have been able to see this and have individual conversations. So I apologize to my colleagues for going into that. And again, I, that, that override number that I heard at the Long Range Planning Committee really shook me to my core. And I think we need to really evaluate a lot of this. And when I do get the um, budget book physically in my hands, I will have um, a conversation, not here at a select board meeting, but with the town manager, and then if appropriate, um, bring it to the full board. The, the public records, part-time public records position, what's that projected at? The figure that we've placed on that was uh, 35,000. That's just base salary. That's not any anything added to it. Will that include health insurance and the like? It would likely be a position that we would keep under the hours uh, that qualify for health insurance. That's again a position that, um, with all due respect, I would ask you know, perhaps if we go sort of the per diem route, because I have been following the public records requests. Um, they're not as um, I don't want to say ambitious, I don't know what the word is, but they really have with COVID-19 um, sort of uh, not been as much of an influx as I think perhaps when we were considering this. So that's something that I don't know that we actually need a designated person. Maybe if we could get per diem, um, maybe if the manager could look at um, adjuncting uh, providing an, an additional stipend to um, somebody on his staff that uh, could handle that. And then if it gets to a really heavy increx that we saw about a year, year and a half ago, that we could go out and hire someone per diem and not incur all of those other costs, that would be um, something I'd ask you to consider. I understand the part-time teen services librarian, um, just a question on what that salary would be. That's approximated at $26,000. To me, that sounds like, uh, given the current um, circumstances, um, I, I'm in agreement with, but I'm not, I'm not anti adding positions. It's just, um, I think I've made my point on that. And then um, I was wondering if, uh, am I correct, 
Mr. Town Manager, Mr. Chapterlane, that we do have a new facility director um, on board, or is that person not yet started? Nope, the new facilities director started, I believe, two weeks ago now, Mr. Greg Walters. Uh, so he has started, um, and that means that Jim Feeney uh, will be coming back um, to the town manager's office, actually start the first of next week. Excellent. Um, and perhaps with the, and I think Jim is exemplary, but um, perhaps um, with the public records requests, the scenario I laid out is somebody else picking that up and maybe the need to hire someone per diem if it started to get heavy again. But um, I would just make a request uh, when appropriate, recognizing Mr. Walters has only been on the job for two weeks, but in light of um, something that's not in our bellywick, which is um, in-person learning at the schools, I'd be interested in what if the facility directors could provide only after it's been provided to the superintendent of schools and the school committee, um, a report on what a safe reopening of our schools here in Arlington would look like. I know Jim Feeney as the acting facilities director last summer um, provided something to the superintendent school committee. And then um, I know I received a copy of it and I think I was still chair and forwarded to my colleagues if we could kind of get that sort of report again, um, sort of how do we open our schools safely? Not saying when, but how do we do that? What needs to be done and um, the implement, implementation of that. So, but I, I'm not making that as a request from us first. I'm assuming that, that that's something that our colleagues in the school committee and the superintendent um, have already asked for, but if you could kind of put us in the uh, pipeline um, to get that afterwards. Absolutely, that's, that's very reasonable. And then um, again, when I get the budget book, I'll definitely have conversations with you, Mr. Chaplain. I'll just reiterate my point um, on the school side only because I lived the special education journey with a severely disabled um, child. Uh, and one of the frustrating points for me and other parents, I used to think it was because of my politics <laughs> and who I was on the board and um, that my child wasn't receiving services they should. I, I realized it wasn't me, it was the circumstance that if you have a severely disabled um, child here in Arlington, uh, to get the services that under law, they say you should get, you, gotta, you have to hire an advocate, an attorney. And what my husband and I did is we just paid tens of thousands of dollars out of our pockets. And I, I just would ask, reiterate my request that really look at special education, especially on the transportation. I've said this to lots of people one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, for the uh, 22 years, my child who's six years out of the public schools, for the 22 years, um, my child was in the system every year under the special education bud budget, there was $10,000 for transportation for my child, which I drove my child every day to Newton and other cities and towns, Lexington, where uh, they went uh, and there was no charge for that. So if you just take 20, well, 20 years times 10,000, um, I'd really like that to be looked at because I'm just saying this as someone who walked in those shoes that you know, you have a child that you don't want to be in that group that you're in. You don't want to be in that club that you're in. And the services, because you have a child with high needs, special needs, um, that can help them be uh, a better adult, young adult, adult, an adult. And you just can't get that money. And when you see it allocated and you see special education money being carried over or reallocated somewhere else, it, it's really frustrating. So whatever we can do through long range planning to kind of get a hand, uh, hand on that, and definitely under the transportation costs, that's always been a bee in my bonnet. So um, I look forward to, I will contact the select board office tomorrow to make sure that they speak to the town manager's office uh, to see how you all are gonna expedite. Um, I cannot print out that budget book. Um, my printer went out about four months ago and I just started working from home two weeks ago, but I can't justify buying a new printer right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for taking up so much time. Thank you, Mr. Diggins.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, look, I mean, I, I appreciate all the uncertainties. I mean, uh, uh, when I used to watch this process, I mean, one of the big uncertainties was not knowing what the governor uh, was going to do for a budget I mean, until after um, this meeting. I mean, so there's lots in there. I mean, there's lots I mean, that can happen on the federal front. I mean, so so um, I mean, you will give us an update, I'm sure, at some point in the near the intermediate future. So I look forward to um, hearing that. Um, I just have a few minor uh, questions. I mean, um, a little quick, just kind of more curiosities. I'm gonna keep them limited because I know it's a long meeting. Um, I noticed some vacancies in DPW and um, um, police and, and fire. Um, any chance, are, are those gonna remain vacant for a while or any plans to fill those? So we had held positions across most departments, uh, vacant positions, uh, we held them vacant um, for the majority uh, of 2020, just to be sure that we had some budgetary flexibility if things yeah. got worse than, than maybe we even expected. Um, we've since uh, started to move to fill um, some of those vacancies. We are moving to fill all of the police vacancies and we're uh, moving to fill the majority of the public works vacancies. So we, we're, we're still being prudent uh, and not, we, we don't wanna leave ourselves with no room in case um, something bad, you know, there was a, a negative turn budgetarily, but we are now moving to fill the majority of the vacancies you see in the book. Great, great. And I, I don't know if this is the venue in which one can make me minor uh, requests. Uh, it's me growing up in a household that did not have a lot of money uh, to say the least. I mean, uh, you know that uh, when you don't have money, you don't really ask to spend stuff. Uh, but um, uh, I mean, one thing that I would like to see us try to do is a little more um, public outreach. I mean, and I can see that in a variety of venues. And I think it's one of those cases where you can get a lot of return on your investment, I mean, it's something that could maybe help us, I mean, when we do need to ask the public to do hard things, I mean, so, so to the extent that maybe we could find a few, a couple thousand dollars hey, to maybe throw at some public outreach through um, um, Envision Arlington or something like that. I think, I think we can make it work for us, but I understand that money's really tight. And so I just tossed it out as a idea. Maybe when we have a little more, we can, we can apply it there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you. And uh, th thank you to the manager for, and uh, Mr. Pooler and the whole team uh, for the work and putting this together. Um, I, I also just had a, a few questions. Um, firstly, um, the mechanism that's being proposed to uh, reserve out um, funds around the, the against potential enrollment growth. Um, is that similar to the mechanism that was used uh, previously to, to um, guard against um, uh, fluctuations in special education spending? I remember there was a special um, reserve fund that was under the finance committee's control. And if so, are we going to have to have a, a warrant article to create the reserve fund uh, for that purpose? So the, we're, we're thinking of it as almost in a, uh, as we think about the current operating reserve. So we're, we're trying to not think about it as a stabilization fund, but uh, rather an operating reserve that would be encumbered and set aside specifically for this issue of enrollment. So we would attempt to do this through a vote on the operating budget, but then the funds could be accessed via a vote of the finance committee and not requiring a calling of a special town meeting. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. Um, also, I had a question on, you know, that that gap between the uh, two point six percent budgeted growth in the in the town side expenses and the three and a quarter percent um, that, that's allowed under the under the um, formula. I, is that gap? I, I mean, I think Mr. Diggins actually started hinting towards part of my question. Um, is that gap uh, strictly? Um, a gap around potential in investment that's not being made, or, or are there um, some costs that are being being held back to, um, to to restrain that growth? I, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding you. So it, it is it is a level service budget. I mean, I, I guess what I was going to ask before 
Mr. Diggins asked his question is whether there were existing positions that were being held held vacant. It sounds like your anticipation is that they will not be held vacant going into the next fiscal year. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, and then my last question is if um, the state funding comes in to, to allow you to go forward with, with the um, some of the other proposed roles, are you anticipating that the uh, compliance officer within inspectional services that even though they report into inspectional services would also have a coordination role with um, Board of Health or, or other um, departments that, that, that may share some responsibility in enforcing uh, the good neighbor agreement? Yes, that, that's a great point. Yes, they, they, they'd have to. I, I think keep. I think positioning them in inspectional services makes the most uh, sense given their role in the Good Neighbor Agreement. But yes, that, that we would have to make sure we had tight coordination, uh, primarily with the Board of Health and other departments as well. Engineering would, would make okay. sense as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just asked because I know that we've all been pulled into constituent um, issues around these types of things, and it, and it does seem to be a, a multi-departmental um, response that's required right. sometimes. Yes, it definitely is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Zikorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine for the uh, presentation this evening and um, talking about the challenges um, that, that, that we face in this budget season and, and, and over the next several years. And one of, one of the difficulties here that, that we have is, is our, our Town Manager Act requires that a budget be produced on January 15th. And um, so we're at a point now where there are so many unknowns that it's difficult to present a document, but the manager is required to present the document. And uh, we I attempted to, to start addressing that a year ago and I, I'm holding off on it by, by trying to address the date um, because it makes it very difficult. And in and, and here, um, for some of these issues with the schools, we're not gonna know until next October 1st, um, when enrollment numbers come in, what, um, what's gonna happen with the enrollment growth figure and, and, and probably with the general budget number as well. So I, I appreciate the challenges that the, 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 the town manager, Mr. Pooler, Ms. Wayman in, in particular have, have had to confront here. And, and uh, in the, the second to last paragraph of the, the uh, budget message, um, the manager did, did state that as the budget process evolves and more information becomes available, the estimates and recommendations will be adjusted as required. And that's, that's, that's what's gonna happen. And, and um, we have a meeting the first half of February uh, for the Long Range Planning Committee. And, and we've got a couple different processes going on here. And the, the individual budgets are developed and approved by the Finance Committee and Long Range Planning works on, on the long range plan. And, and of course, the goal here is to push out the period between overrides as long as possible while, while still providing services. And um, where difficult decisions have to be made, they, they will have to be made over the next two years. Um, but I, I think it's, it's just really hard. I mean, we don't know what the governor, we have an idea now what the governor is gonna do, but this, this budget document didn't, didn't reflect that. We have a lot of unknowns. We have a lot of discussions going on between the finance committee and the school committee or school department in particular, in terms of how you take a look at, at um, budget numbers and, and if there are gonna be any surpluses in certain areas, are they returned to the um, general fund and, and uh, impact free cash or, or not? And um, we're, we're gonna know a little bit in the fall and, and, and we're gonna have to, to continue here. And, and you know, there is gonna have to be ongoing budget messaging. And, and to Mrs. Mahan's point that you know, there, there will be further discussions and we're gonna, we're gonna need those further discussions. And, and I think you know, this document over the next two months before town meeting could change significantly or, or could change. I mean, I think the significant changes probably could be next fall when we get a better idea around things. So I, I can see the, the difficulty that, um, that you're going through here. When I, when I was on the finance committee, I went through two recessions um, and you have a lot of unknowns as you go through the, um, the, the, the budget season, you try to do the best you can. And I think the ultimate goal is to take that deficit in fiscal 24 and try to eliminate it so that you know, our commitment 
um, that we made in the last override is that we wouldn't go back to the voters until fiscal 24. Our, our history as a town has been that it's been much longer periods between overrides, and I and I hope we can it can achieve that. And that that's done yeah. through looking at expenses. It's it's looking at revenues and 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 frankly, it's looking at growth in the community um, as, as well. And and there there is some mention of that in the budget message that you know, be, between um, potential increases to the to the tax base. And while that's not something that 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 you're going to drive every decision on that, they're all related. Okay. And and so um, I I this is more of a commentary tonight than any questions for the manager. We we have had some discussions about the budget, but I understand the um, the difficulty that uh, that 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 you have here, and and um, you know what what we're going to go forward with, and and maybe as we go through the season, maybe we get another budget presentation or, or message in February, and maybe another one in March as as we have better information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to make a similar comment. Um, I know we had taken that up last year, and we had some. Um, pushback from the finance committee regarding the dates for the budget submission, but in the next couple of years, more than ever, the uncertainty of state aid is gonna be a key factor in our budget. So I think it's definitely something to take another look at. Um, to, so when we have the presentation, we have a little more clarity as to what our situation is. But I think Mr. DeCourcy covered that very well. Um, and then just on the enrollment growth, figure so the million dollar set aside so is that and if I'm not describing this cor correctly let me know but so in the event that all of the students that left last year came back and then we got back on track for normal growth factors is that million dollars going to be enough to cover that the additional growth factor funds that we need so the this that number is calculated on the assumption that they get they get back to status quo and they then go over that and yep. we calculated it based on what we had already been calculating as an anticipated number for fy22 yep. so yeah i think is there a risk that it comes back all the way and even more than we expected in fy22 yes i i think that's a a low probability risk but there there is risk that that could happen but that actually it, that wouldn't be uh, a unique experience for the school department because we've actually always funded their growth on a sort of a, a prospective or a re retrospective basis where we give them the growth factor money based on what their growth was the year before. Yep. So um, so I, I think this puts us in a good position um, to be able to get to where they're likely, uh, you know, likely the ceiling would be in terms of a rebound in enrollment. And more than anything, I just wanted to make sure that we had enough to anticipate at least all of the students coming back, which it sounds like that's the case. Because, oh, the, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so I think, I, just to be clear, our operating assumption is so that so they, they not only didn't have the, the growth, but they're down almost 300 students. Right. So our operating assumption is that they, they have as, as, as much, if not more, money than they need this year based on the reduction in students, mm -hmm. such that by maintaining that number, and growing it by three and a half percent, that they automatically would be going into FY22 with an adequate amount of funds based on okay. that, based on that premise. Yep, understood. Yeah, and I only say that because, you know, I know a lot of people that have kids in the schools right now, and I have a number of people that are outside of the district, and just about everyone I know will is coming back next year. But no, that's not to say you know, it's unlikely that everyone comes back because some people go to new school, they like it there and, and they'll stay. But I would anticipate a good amount of those people that left this year are gonna be coming back next year. So as long as we're prepared for that and it sounds like we are. And I did just check my email. I apologize, I must've checked out early for the long weekend. So I did, I did see the budget email that you sent me. All right, so with that, I, I don't think we have any additional comments. Do we have a motion? Uh, Mr. Carl? Move to receive. Yes, and Mr. DeCourcy? Second. All right, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion by Mr. Carl, second by Mr. DeCourcy. Mrs. Mahan. 
Yes, but I'd still like to get my hard copy budget book. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right, and that brings us to our consent agenda. So the first item on the consent agenda tonight is meeting of minutes, January 1st, 2021. We're gonna take that one out separately. Um, so Mr. Carl. Yeah. I'll... So, so I'll take the meeting of minutes from January 4th, 2021. Are you just going to abstain? From I'm going to abstain from it. Yeah, I was. I was not. I was not. All right, Mrs. Corsi. Uh, yeah, move approval. All right, Mrs. Mahan. Second. All right, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Abstain. Mr. Hurd. Yes. All right. And then that takes us to the rest of our consent agenda. So adding one item to the consent agenda for approval, Black History Month banners, Crystal Haynes, Arlington Human Rights Commission. Then we have reappointment, transportation advisory committee, Dewey Ray Jones, term to expire 1231-2024. Reappointment zoning board of appeals, Sean O'Rourke, term to expire October 2023, reappointments term to expire January 31st, 2024, Board of Health, Marie Walsh Condon, MD, Cemetery Commission, Brian Hasbrook, William McCarthy, Conservation Commission, David White, Constable Roland Demers, Disability Commission, Paul Rea, and Darcy Devney, Equal Opportunity Advisory Committee, Augusta Haydock, Jack Jones, and Barbara Boltz. Historical Commission, Diane Schaefer, Pam Meister, and Joanne Robinson. Human Rights Commission, Kristen Bauer. Library Board of Trustees, Adam Del Molino and Amy Hampy. The LGBTQIA Plus Rainbow Commission, Lisa Krinsky. Park and Recreation Commission, Leslie Mayer, Veterans Council, Jeff Melton, and Stephen Sautel. Do you have a motion from Mr. Diggins? I motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. And Mr. Corsi? Second. All right, any additional comments, Mr. Carl? No, I just, I was wondering, are we including the other item that was on the emergency addendum in this consent agenda or separate yeah. vote? So separate I read vote? it. Oh, I you read did, I'm sorry. First. Yep. Sorry, sorry. Yep, no problem. And Ms. Mon, any comments? Um, no, I, I would vote yes. I, I don't know if Crystal Haynes is um, at the meeting with us and wants to speak to this. If not, that's okay. So I would vote yes. All right, Ms. Chaplin, do you know if Chris wanted to present anything on this? She's here if we want to ask her to say anything. Okay. Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. All right. Good evening. Yes, Thank can. you. If you could just explain a little bit more about what um, actually the request is and what it will look like. Of course. Um, so I, uh, I, I know we were a little bit a couple hours uh, late in submitting the, the actual images. We actually had a really exciting um, co-sponsorship with the Commission on Arts and Culture here in Arlington, who helped us provide um, a, a stipend to the artists this year, which is super exciting. Um, and so the artist, um, Rachel DeMond, is an, actually is an East Arlington native. Um, who is now based in Roxbury. Um, we put out a statewide call and we ended up with Rachel's designs, which was super exciting. Um, and basically the theme for this year's banners 
um, which we intend to hang along uh, a Mass Ave in East Arlington because last year we we have the banners, the lar uh, larger banners that go from Broadway Square to Town Hall, the 16 banners there. So we wanted to make sure we had an, a, a presence in East Arlington as well, a, a further, a larger presence in East Arlington. And this year's theme was um, fighting for social justice. And so Rachel chose um, six uh, particular, uh, actually it's five individuals in a group and one group, um, and they're all black female um, figures in, in history and in modern history that are fighting for um, uh, social justice, which includes um, Angela Davis, uh, Ella Baker, um, Mariel Franco, um, Marsha P. Johnson, um, Santi Belair, and the, um, Kombahi uh, River Collective. And these are all folks who, who are connected to the civil rights movement. Um, and so she created six. We're gonna, because the banners are kind of small on Mass Ave, we're gonna repeat them. Um, and so this is part of our Black History Month um, series that we, we are making annual on the HRC. Um, you know, last year we we had we had we're able to have events in person. This year we can't. So this will be in in addition to the banner unveiling, we'll have a, a virtual meet the artist with Rachel Demon, where where folks will be able to get to know her her background in East Arlington. She was super excited about this project because she felt like growing up as a black woman in in East Arlington as a kid, she never really felt seen. So she was really excited about this opportunity to be able to do, to put black women up uh, in East Arlington and have other girls like her feel seen. Um, this There will also be a Black History Month read aloud with selected um, works with uh, students from the high school. Uh, we were hoping to pull in some, uh, it, with help with some of the digs and stuff like that, maybe some littler kids, but can't manage that. The high school kids have got it. They're very excited about being a part of this project. And then um, having our uh, a webinar on having difficult conversations. And so we're in the process of secure, difficult conversations around race. Um, and we're, we're um, in, uh, you know, some conver some negotiations with facilitators around that, including Dr. Amante Jackson, who's worked with several school districts around um, uh, in and around Greater Boston and things like that. But as you can imagine, these folks are in super high demand right now. So we are, so we're 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 in the negotiation process with them. Thank you. Turn to the board for any questions, uh, Mr. Diggins. Sorry about that. Muted myself. I mean, no, this is great, uh, Ms. Haynes. You know, it's really, really great. And living in the East, I mean, I look forward to seeing them. I looked at the pictures of banners. I mean, they're they're impressive. I also like that it is educational because I mean, these are lesser known figures. I mean, uh, and and hopefully sometime we'll be able to do the East and the center. And you know, I'm just thinking we don't have. I don't think we have any place to hang banners uh, in in um in the Heights. So maybe we do uh, not. We do not. <laughs> yes, yes, we did. So I think we need some of those folks on the um, Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan Implementation Committee. I think that I got that right. We need to get to work on that. So, so thank mm -hmm. you, Ms. Haynes, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Haynes, for the presentation tonight, for all the work that you've been doing um, on the Human Rights Commission and, and with the community conversations. And I think it's great that Rachel Dumond is the artist. She went, she went to the Hardy School and uh, um, it's, it's wonderful that uh, she's been selected and, and um, I, you know, I look forward to, to, to seeing the banners up on Mass Ave. Thank you, Ms. Nahan. Um, I, I just had one question, if I could, through the chair to uh, yep. Ms., Ms. Haynes. Um, we have a color copy of the banners um, that will be uh, placed in East Arlington in the center. I'm just wondering, uh, is there going to be any sort of identifying or other information on the banners in terms of if somebody drives by and, and says, oh, I know that's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but I'm not sure who that picture by Rachel DeMont is. Is there gonna be any sort of identifying markers or a website or something else? Are you anticipating that with your outreach program, that's where you, you'll disseminate that information? 
Yeah. So, so, so like last year, what we will do is we'll put all the banners, including the ones from last year up on the um, human rights website where you'll be able to scroll over the, where you will click on the descriptions and have um, reading materials connected to them. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you and everyone else that's, that's been working on this um, in terms of really um, opening up our Arlington community uh, and uh, not just educating them, but um, getting them interested in looking into something that they didn't really know about before. And I, I, I know they'll be really inspired that once they look to the information and, and get it, um, they'll appreciate more living here in the Arlington community. So um, thank you, Ms. Haynes, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Mr. Carroll? Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for all your work on this. I mean, I loved the uh, Black History Month banners that we had hanging last year. These ones just really pop. They're, they're beautiful and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're bright. Um, and uh, I, I love the fact that you, you partnered with the uh, ACAC um, on this as well. I, I love to see that cooperation, I guess. To, to quote one of your banners, uh, Yong Fe La Force, unity is strength. So um, thank you for all of the work on this. And I really look forward to seeing them uh, go up. All right, and I also just wanna thank you for all the work that you've done. And this is exciting. This is always a really nice event. And when we can see these each year up and down Mass Ave, it, it's really a great thing to see. And this year is, you know, you top yourself as generally happens. Uh, so I appreciate all the work. And while I have you here, congratulations. That was a great event on MLK Day. You know, it was, uh, you know, that, that's an event that we look forward to it each year because it's fun and it's a great celebration and really important. And it's tough this year with, uh, with COVID, but it really was a moving event. So you did an excellent job. So appreciate oh. that as well, all the work you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your support. Thank you. All right. So Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I would vote yes and ask Ms. Haynes for next year's MLK activities. If there's anything else, if the wor world gets back to semi-normal, um, that we should add to that. I'd kind of like to make you the purveyor of overseeing that. So yes, <laughs> <Okay>. thank you. <laughs> Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Lowe. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take us through our consent agenda. It is now nine o'clock with the Mr. Vice Chair. That, that was my fault. I, yes. I, try, I, I tried to have uh, remove Crystal and I accidentally clicked on Mr. Hurt. I apologize. We have, we have, uh... My oh, back. <laughs> that was not an attempted coup on my part. Sorry, Sorry Mr. <laughs> okay with that. All right. So it's now nine o'clock. We have a long ag agenda item coming up by a show of hands or comments to the board. Would anybody like to take a break at this point? Can I get like five minutes? I've got like three phone calls. Sure. Just five minutes. Is that okay? Yep. So it's nine o'clock now. We'll come back at nine oh seven. How about that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just have an administrative matter for the yep. board discussion. I, I have a, uh, a very brief uh, PowerPoint timeline with respect to the UGAR update. Yep. Uh, it's totally up to the board whether or not, given the length of the meeting, you'd like me to go through it. But I just wanted to put that out there for the chair's discretion. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yep. Back here, we are now at the public hearings. It is 7.15 p.m. So we have a C CDBG performance update for program year 2020 to 2021 by Mal Mallory Sullivan, our community development block grant administrator. 
and CDBG requests for fiscal year 2021 to 2022 funding, also by Mal Mallory Sullivan, our Community Development Block Grant Administrator. Mallory? Good evening. Um, yes, I'm Mallory Sullivan, the Community Development Block Grant Administrator in the Department of Planning and Community Development. I haven't had a chance yet to present to the select board, so I'm, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, so I do have these two agenda items. The first is the mid-year report and this uh, on the current year's program activities. And the second is an overview of program year 47. So if it's all right with you, I will speak to uh, both of them. Um, and we do have several subrecipients um, who should be in attendance this evening. Yep. Um, who I request that they can speak to their programs um, afterwards about both of these. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so this is the town's 46th year receiving funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as an entitlement community through the CDBG program. These funds are used to support a variety of activities that benefit Arlington residents, especially low to moderate income households. Uh, for the purposes of housing, public facilities and parks, public services, um, and economic development activities. Um, so for some updates for our current year, which is uh, the for program year 46, um, currently the town is in the first of a five-year consolidated planning period. And this year the town was awarded an allocation of just over $1.1 million dollars which we were able to supplement with program income and unappropriated funds from prior years for a total allocation of approximately $1.6 million. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that our subrecipients have made impressive efforts toward their anticipated goals, which are the figures they stated in their applications of the numbers of individuals they anticipated uh, serving, the number of housing units established, um, or other measures uh, and other metrics. And in particular, they provided these critical services to clients this year um, and, and continue to work on their capital projects despite the disruptions um, brought forth by the pandemic, which of course weren't anticipated when they submitted their applications over a year ago. Um, in terms of housing and rehabilitation projects, the Housing Corporation of Arlington uh, has used funds to support its capital improvement on, the, on HCA's affordable housing portfolio improving 26 units or the buildings in which those units are located to date. And this work, of course, uh, has a, a wide range of um, areas that it affects um, from roofing to furnace work, painting, siding, installation of hot water heaters and many other necessities uh, to maintain the housing portfolio. For public facilities and improvements, uh, there have been significant strides that uh, have also been taken toward improving and building public facilities in terms of making spaces safer and more accessible and more resilient. The Whittemore Park project, um, there have been some delays um, partly due to the pandemic. Um, however, design services for phase two of this project, which is the CDBG funded portion, are currently out to bid uh, with design work as well as construction anticipated later this year. Um, so CDBG is funding just the second phase, and um, this is just part of um, the overarching three-phase project. The Department of Public Works continues its curb cut ramps, um, and this fall completed um, curb cuts at Eastern Ave at Situate Street and Newport Street. Now, because this funding request um, in particular was made after the normal application period, um, unappropriated funds were allocated through a substantial amendment and the CDBG funded work began later than it typically would um, in September. Uh, the Town Hall Plaza project is well underway as um, everyone uh, who's been by Town Hall at any point lately knows. Um, the restoration of course is addressing the barriers at the main entry plaza um, and I believe they are uh, taking a hiatus for the winter conditions but will commence again in the spring. Um, and lastly, in the area of public facilities and improvements, um, we have two nonprofit subrecipients, Arlington Eats and the Food Link, which have both been working on capital projects that have made significant progress this year. And I believe we have representatives from those two organizations, so I will let them speak to the details of their projects um, later on this evening. 
Um, for our public service activities, many of these subrecipients are also joining us, um, so I'll provide a more generalized update for you. The public service activities are doing very well in terms of reaching their goals. Uh, many have already achieved their, uh, their metric goal um, or are nearly halfway there um, at this mid-year mark. In total, uh, nearly 2,000 individuals have been served through these programs, meaning that altogether public service programs have achieved about 75% of their collective goal for number of individuals served. And this is just halfway through the program year um, with the providers continuing to serve existing clients and new ones um, for the remainder of the year. And I just want to spotlight that these agencies, of course, are, uh, are, are responding to COVID-19, even if that wasn't the intention of uh, the services. So just for one example is that the Council on Aging's transportation program is uh, driving individuals to COVID-19 tests um, and delivering uh, necessary items to those who are um, in quarantine. Uh, for economic development, this year $50,000 uh, was originally programmed for a workforce development program, which couldn't take place due to the pandemic. This money, uh, this funding was reallocated, reprogrammed to the Arlington Small Business COVID-19 Relief Program in support of microenterprises. Um, an additional allocation, um, which was made possible through the CARES Act, uh, was also allocated to this, um, this small business program. And overall, between the two sources, 25 businesses have been supported with grants of approximately $10,000 each. And finally, um, in planning and administration, our department has participated in a number of CDBG funded projects, some of which I mentioned earlier. Um, notably though, I would like to mention that the annual town survey in Vision Arlington is currently open and will be open through March 1st. So I encourage anyone who has yet to take that uh, to, to hop onto the website and, um, to, and to participate. Um, if there aren't any questions now, I would like to move on to the program year 47 requests, but I'm also happy to take any yeah. questions now. Let me just run through the board to see if anyone has any questions about the update. Mr. Dagan? Thank you, no questions. Mr. DeCourcy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan, uh, no questions. Mr. Carroll? Thank you, no, that was very thorough, I appreciate it. Mrs. Mahan? Um, Ms. Sullivan, touch on this. I just wanna make sure I understand. Um, we have regular CDBG funding allocations. We also have the funding under the CARES Act too that provided relief to small businesses. I know um, the original CARES Act, um, the town um, started an effort to uh, with members of the planning department and some volunteers to reach out to small businesses that might not know how to get this information. Um, uh, is the CARES Act two small business funding included in this? And if it is, has that been successful or do we need to relaunch that outreach program again? So the, the CARES Act funding was actually uh, per HUD guidance is programmed into the 2019-2020 uh, program year annual action plan. Um, so I believe the uh, we have a, a new program that uh, the application period closed last week and that was a separate program from this one. Um, it reaches a larger number of businesses because it has fewer restrictions in terms of um, in terms of uh, various eligibility requirements. Um, so that program uh, did receive um, adequate applications. Um, so, uh, does that answer your question? I, I think it does. I think um, when we originally started the program, we didn't see the number of businesses for the allocation that was allotted um, come in. So we did that outreach program. But what, from what I'm understanding you're saying is um, under, under the CARES Act too, um, the outreach or the, the knowledge is known and an ad adequate number of businesses for the allocation has been reached. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. All right, Ms. Sullivan, you can move on. 
Thank you. Um, so for our program year 47 requests, uh, program year 47, of course, begins on July 1st of this year. Um, we expect an entitlement of approximately $1.1 million, um, which is in following with allocations from recent years. And as you can see in the materials that were provided in tonight's meeting documents, the CBBG program received 18 applications. Uh, one of those was from our department for planning and administrative purposes. Um, there are also numerous returning applicants requesting funding for ongoing programs and new activities. I'd like to just briefly touch upon a few of the new requests um, and then turn things over to the subrecipients um, in attendance. Um, the new a few of the new applications include uh, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, which has submitted a proposal for CDBG funding. That would be HCA's equity for the acquisition of a building at 1021 Mass Ave for development of affordable housing units. Caritas Communities is a new applicant. Um, it's an agency dedicated to preventing homelessness. And uh, Caritas Communities has made a request for funding to improve two affordable housing residences in town. And um, a new economic development program um, that the Department of Planning and Community Development uh, has made a request for is aimed at bringing technical assistance to small businesses in town. Um, this, ta this program is modeled after the current technical assistance program um, that is uh, set to begin soon um, as part of the pandemic response program, um, but it will be open to more businesses in town, uh, providing different areas of technical assistance from e-commerce and live commerce, website development, bookkeeping, um, and more depending upon the needs identified. Um, so from here on out, the next steps um, will be an application review, including two meetings with the select board's CDBG subcommittee. These meetings will ideally take place uh, over the course of the next month or so, um, at which point, uh, we will hopefully have recommendations uh, regarding which applications to fund. Um, so I thank you for your time this meeting and I'm happy to uh, take any questions at this point. All right, um, does the board have any questions before we go to the individual applicants? No, all right, so I, I have a list here. Um, I don't know if you know who's in attendance, but the first person that I have here is Caritas Communities. Do we have a representative from Caritas here with us? You know, if they could just yep. raise their hands. And so there's two hands raised there. I see. So I see Tom Nee. Hi, Ms. Nee, can you hear us? Good evening, um, Mr. Chairman, um, Select Board. Thank you for hearing me tonight. Can you hear me? Yeah, can I just ask you a brief question? Because it is a Christine Shaw who has her hand raised as well. Is she with you? She's, our, she's the Council on Aging Director. Okay, yep, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Thank you um, for hearing us tonight and having us an opportunity to present in front of you this evening. Um, my name is Tom Nee. I'm a resident of Arlington, um, and I live at 76 River Street in Arlington, um, and I work for Caritas Communities. We're a nonprofit affordable housing company founded back in 1985, um, and we have a few, two different buildings in Arlington. We've owned one for 29 years and one for 23 years. And we um, own and operate our properties to provide uh, clean, decent, safe, affordable housing um, to low income and very low income members of society, some of which have been homeless in the past. And, and um, we try to give them an opportunity to um, have a, a nice, uh, safe, decent home for themselves and, and, and to help better themselves. Um, we come to you tonight. Um, we've had a little bit of a challenge over the last year or so with some expenses that have come up on our properties. We had one building up in Arlington on Fresno Road. Um, we had a sewer line that that failed on the rear of the property that we had to connect to 
the main line in the street and we had a boiler fail in the property this past year along with the challenges in the pandemic it just became a situation where we were looking to continue with our development and capital planning for improvements at these locations and um, we thought that it might be a good opportunity to see if we could request some CDBG assistance for those projects. Um, so we have a total of uh, 20 SRO uh, single room occupancy, um, shared kitchen, shared bath, living um, units in one property and 15 in the other. Um, and one is at, as I mentioned, 22 Pheasant Road in Arlington, and the other is at 12 Russell Terrace in Arlington. So we come to you tonight in hopes that we may be able to present ourselves in the way that we could um, gain your support for our recommendation of, of some bathroom renovations at our property at, at 22 Pheasant Road, along with some exterior um, walk-in in, um, driveway paving improvements. Um, the buildings, they, they're over well over 100 years old each, and um, the property at Pheasant Road we've had um, for 29 years and, and really haven't had any upgrades on the interior baths or any of those areas. So that's a primary uh, cost of our request and along with some additional improvements to, as I mentioned, to the other areas. But I'm happy to answer any questions. We have a couple other members of our team on the call um, are Sarah uh, Fendrick, who is our grants manager and Victor Martinez, who is our chief operating officer. So thank you for taking the time to hear us tonight and I'd be happy to answer any questions I could. All right, thank you. And I'll turn to the board, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, between the two locations at 22 Fezzedin and well, Russell Terrace, I think what was said, um, by applying for these CDBG uh, monies, if successful, will would that open up? And it's okay if it doesn't. Would that open up any other matching funding or, or similar funding um, to go towards these two locations? Yes, me. Yes, we've we we have a commitment of of twenty nine thousand two hundred fifty dollars that Caritas would be using to help leverage the the cdbg money assistance yes okay if so that if that answers your question i'm on i want to make sure correctly answering it for you no no i i guess just just to expand upon that if you did not receive these cdbg monies would that preclude you from any caritas funds or any other uh non-profit or other funding Certainly, I think that it would certainly uh, push any of these projects down the, the, the road um, until we had we were able to obtain additional funding to help support those projects. Um, we haven't done them in years past and we've uh, had planned to do them, but we ran into additional expenses, as I mentioned earlier, that kind of uh, put us in the situation where we are today. So um, it would if we weren't able to obtain them, we we would need to delay the work. Okay, Th thank you. You definitely answered my question and I do appreciate that. Um, besides looking to Arlington CDBG funds, you're also looking for a partnership or some other tie-in for some other funding that will make this successful. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Yeah, Mr. Carroll? No, I have no additional questions. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. DeCorsi? No questions, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Higgins. Uh, no questions for me either. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Thank you. And we will just, this is a public here. We'll go through all the applicants um, that would like to speak, and then we'll open this up for public comments at the end for any members of the public that want to speak on any of the items, they can do so at that time. So the next that I have on the list here is the Housing Corporation of Arlington. And I did just see. I, I just promoted. Hi. Is yes. Pam. Oh. Can you hear me? That's why she's not on the list that I'm looking for. Yep. Hi, Ms. Hallett. Hi, how are you? There we are. Um, good evening. Nice to be here. I want to first uh, say that uh, thank you very much for the 
funds that we used for last year for our uh, capital improvements, we replaced seven different boilers or furnaces, put on four roofs and sided a number of our buildings. So uh, our tenants are much happier this year, much warmer and uh, have no rain falling in on them, which is terrific. Um, the new uh, project that we're bringing is our, um, we're just negotiating the purchase and sale agreement now. Uh, it looks like it's going through. We're in the final stages of 1021 Mass Ave. We're hoping to be able to put 18 to 30 units there. We also may be able to negotiate a purchase price for the building next door to it, which would allow us to do a, a larger development, um, but we're not quite sure if that one's coming through yet or not. But I also wanna point out that you've also given us a lot of CDBG for 19R Park Ave. So our two buildings there are um, more than 50% complete. If you've been by recently, we've got brick and siding up and windows. Um, and we're very excited about that. And our building at 117 Broadway is uh, coming along beautifully. It's a little bit slower than the other two. You had some trouble with Eversource, but uh, we're very excited and we hope you all have noticed it because we, uh, we're, we're very pleased with it. So thank you very much. All right, and I will turn to the board for any questions, Mr. Carl. No, no questions, the application's uh, pretty thorough. Thank Mr. you. Dickens? Thank you. No questions, thank you. Mr. Corsi? Uh, no questions, thank you. And Ms. Mon. Uh, no questions, but thank you, Ms. Hallett. Um, everything going on in Down Square and, and everywhere else. I'm very excited by it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Alec. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Next group that I have on here is Arlington Boys and Girls Club. Do we have anybody from the Boys and Girls Club? If you could just rate, use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. I don't recognize anybody. Yeah, I don't recognize any names. All right. Arlington High School at athletic scholarships. I assume there's no one there for that, right? Oh yeah, I don't see John. I think it would be perfect, John. All right. Arlington Housing Authority. Anyone from the Housing Authority? Nope. Arlington Youth Counseling Center. No, I don't think so. Um, Long. All right, so now that takes us to the Council on, on Aging. Can Ms. Shaw still with us? There she is, yep. Good evening. Hi, Ms. Shaw. How are you? Good, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. And um, I promise to be as brief as possible given you know how late it is and to respect everybody's time, but I'm happy to join you all today. Um, last time I was here, last January, when we presented our applications for CDBG, um, it was before any of the pandemic was even you know, a thought on anybody's mind. So I'm really proud of what the Council on Aging has been able to do as a part of um, the three applications that you so generously funded for us last year. Um, and we also were able to be awarded a special COVID-19 related CDBG fund um, grant um, for a technology loan library that I wanted to briefly update you on. Um, that library to date has um, created um, a really an inventory of about 60 Chromebooks and about 20 hotspots that um, older, the older adults in Arlington who did not have access to technology before the pandemic were able to reserve through us. Um, we have a volunteer team of individuals who, um, who are, are on call to help people set up their devices and help them um, use them. So that has been a really great CDBG um, funded program that we were happy to establish um, in addition to the funds that were part of the year 46. Um, 
And for year 47, we are, um, we did submit three grant proposals um, for level funding for, th for three very big areas that we serve. Um, I'll briefly explain um, each of them. One of them is for our transportation services program. Um, you, you know, even with the pandemic going on, our transportation never stopped. Uh, we are receiving um, calls every day from people that need to get to important medical appointments. They need, um, you know, their pharmacy runs completed. They need, you know, items from the grocery store. And although we have done our best to have our older adults in Arlington and they have really done an amazing job of staying home when it's very hard to do so, there are times that they um, have needed to go out for important um important reasons and you know our transportation i'm proud to say is has been available to them even when uber was closed for a little while um, in the spring and even when you know the mbta cut back services we're still there getting people where they need to go so um we've put a lot of covid precautions in place our our van drivers only drive one person at a time um, of course we follow all of the masks and social distancing um, and for the, up until August, we were able to offer our transportation at no charge to people that needed it during the pandemic. Um, people really appreciated that because only the most necessary of trips were happening at that time. Um, and it also was able to, you know, we, we didn't really, we cut back on the amount of cash that was being handed between our drivers and our riders. So um, we were happy to be able to do that to support the older adults in Arlington. Um, one of the other um, big, big programs that this, that CDBG funds for us annually is our volunteer coordinator position. Again, given the pandemic, we went from up to about 200 volunteers that for the Council on Aging to about 300 um, in one year, which is a huge difference. And that's because, you know, people, people need volunteer assistance right now more than ever. We've had um, great partnerships with Arlington Eats. We've had great partnerships with um, organizations in town that really, um, you know, have, have helped us recruit new volunteers. Um, all of our food service programs that we run for nutrition access, um, such as our, our par partnerships with the Greater Boston Food Bank and also our farmer's market that we run were delivered to people this year because it was not in their best interest to come out due to the pandemic. So we had lower risk volunteers pick up items in the driveway of our center and drive them to people's doorsteps and call them when the items have been dropped off. Um, we also have numerous volunteers that are doing telephone call reassurance program wellness checks weekly to folks that um, really don't have access to technology and we don't have the ability to check in with as much. Um, just old fashioned phone calls work really well for some people and the volunteers that are working on those are um, very, very important and are reporting to us um, how, how folks are doing and what they need from us. Um, I mentioned the volunteers that we put into place uh, that are helping people with technology. Um, many, many of our, of our older adults in Arlington do not have access to the internet. Um, and, like, and like I said, needed a hotspot to be able to go with a Chromebook to be able to access technology. So we have volunteers that are talking them through over the phone, you know, how to plug in their laptop, how to access our virtual programs. All of our programs that we were running um, at 27 Maple Street, um, they are happening over Zoom. It's pretty in impressive. Every single day we have at least 60 people signing on for exercise classes and talks and lunches. And we do some drive-through events where they pick up a coffee and then Zoom with us over, over, the, um, over the internet. And that's all completely different than we thought we were going to be doing when we talked about these volunteer programs last year, but um, they've changed a lot, but they're very, still very important in a, in a very different way. So we're very lucky to have CDBG's support. Um, and finally, our adult day scholarships that is funded through CDBG annually is um, still very important. Our partner cooperative elder services um, was of course, like everywhere else in the pandemic, they were closed for, for some time because of the direct contact that they have with um, their clients, but they have since reopened and there is 
a huge need, as you can imagine, with all of the social isolation for um, older adults to access um, adult day programs. And um, they're, they've started you know, following limitations, but re-enrolling folks from Arlington to be able to use their services, awarding them the scholarships through this grant. And we foresee that um, getting back up to normal numbers as soon as, as soon as vaccinations are more widely rolled out. So thank you very much for all of your support in the past and I'm happy to answer any questions about any of our programs. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Mon. First, first I wanna thank Ms. Shaw. I've um, overindulged um, providing her as a resource um, to our seniors uh, here in Arlington and I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and I know it's part of the job that you want to do and you do do. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, um, in light of uh, Governor Baker's statement today regarding the, his press conference today regarding the uh, vaccination program and how people, seniors and other individuals need to sign up online on the, the state's website at mass.gov slash COVID vaccine. Um, I'm thinking of seniors uh, like my parents who live with me in their late 80s who don't have email, don't have a laptop, don't have a computer, and don't really have access to that um, information. Um, and I understand Ms. Shaw has um, uh, volunteers that are working with her, but I'm wondering uh, in terms of what outreach how do we reach those seniors uh, here in Arlington, whether, whether through the Board of Health or the Council on Aging or others? Um, what I'm asking you is, what resource can you give to me to provide to seniors that don't have the technology that really aren't on websites online and can't access them? Um, what is the advice I should give to them through this program that hopefully you'll get some CDBG funding from, but more importantly, access to information on a vaccination program because there's a lot of questions around that in terms of uh, when you're eligible and how you get it. You're exactly right. And um, a lot of our, that's really our job at the Council on Aging and we try to kind of see that coming. And the fact that people are signing, needing to sign up for vaccinations online is a hurdle. Um, so really any of the town vaccination clinics that roll out for Arlington residents, people can register by calling us at the Council on Aging. And we're making that clear. Um, we're under the Board of Health and um, when we get to the point and it's, and it's gonna be soon that we're um, starting to open up vaccination clinics for um, our older adults in town, we'll pretty much be doing it all over the phone, the registering by um, and signing up for a vaccine slot by phone. All of our staff will be doing that. Um, so really anytime there's something that's required online, people can call us, we'll assist them in signing up or if they're interested, we'll try to get them technology if they're, in, if they're interested in learning or using it. Um, and some people aren't, and that's completely fine. We just, we have plenty of ways of doing things um, so that they can be comfortable. We can do things via um, conference call if they wanna do things on the phone um, or just old fashioned over the phone and we'll type it in for them. Okay, so um, what I'm hearing the message is a, if you're a senior and um, you don't have the te technology to do that, me as a member of the select board or anyone else is gonna give the Council on Aging um, phone number to kind of walk you through that. And then I don't know that this is your Balawick, but um, developmentally disabled adults. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's your area of expertise, but if, if, if somebody, is in that group, mm -hmm. can I also refer them to calling the Council on Aging or someone else like the Board of Health if they don't have the technology or the expertise to maneuver their way through that? Of course, yes. And we'll, we'll assist them or we'll put them in touch with the correct person who can help them for sure. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
you. And Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Shaw, and, and um, this is uh, good work that you're doing, uh, and I know that you are also uh, participating on the advisory committee for the Sustainable Transportation Plan, uh, and so I'll be able to talk with you more about some things related to transportation, but just a quick, a couple of quick questions. Uh, have you noticed um, any um, increase in demand for your um, transportation services since uh, the MBTA has cut back on services? Um, we have, yes, um, we, we have, and it's not necessarily just related to the bus, um, and the bus service or the T service, but um, a lot of our folks are very dependent on the ride, the MBTA ride. Um, that actually has been running the entire time throughout the pandemic as well, um, but on a more limited basis. So a lot of folks that use that service or even you know don't feel as comfortable using the bus because of the number number of people on it but our van you know is is much smaller and uses has much less social interaction um we have seen an uptick in people using our services just because it's um, more smaller and, and a little bit safer i see so what was the cut back in the ride um, it was only that they cut back, they didn't cut back on funds, but it was the number of people that could be on the ride at the right. same time. So it was gotcha. just a scheduling issue. Gotcha. Okay, fine, fine. And one final question. And so um, the, the, the Boston MPO, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, has this plan called the Coordinated Public Transit Human Services um, Transportation Plan. Aware of that? Are you aware of that? Um, I've heard of it through the town. We're, um, we're part of a bunch of different councils on aging in towns around us and that yeah. has come up, yes. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's really very interesting. And, and I mean, there's a lot of, 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 of um, programs and, and, and types of services I mean, that they utilize in order to help um, especially elderly folks in, in doing transportation. So I'll follow up with you more on this, you know, uh, uh, but I think there's a lot of potential there a lot. And, and so uh, the coordination be amongst the smaller towns in the, in the area uh, to really help people get me to where they want to go. So great work. Thank you very much. Mr. Carroll. Thank you very much. Um, as the board's uh, liaison to the Council on Aging, I want to Welcome, Ms. Ms. Shah, and I'm, I'm glad that my colleagues get to see a glimpse of the, uh, the professionalism and the creativity and the energy that you uh, um, br bring to the job. Um, you know, one, one thing that, you know, my colleagues may not, well, may not see is that I know that you do a lot of grant writing on top of the, the CDBG requests that we have here, and that's, that's really uh, appreciated. Um, but also one thing that I want to make sure people are aware of is that the Council on Aging just went through this massive logistical challenge of trying to relocate physically all of the various uh, programs and, and, and services to, to other locations to accommodate the um, renovation of the community center. And then COVID hit and then everything had to be reinvented. And I think Ms. Shah referenced that here. And so some of this request you know, supports um, the folks who help to, to make sure that that, that keeps going. So uh, I just want to make sure that, that that doesn't go unacknowledged. So thank you. Thank you. It's great having you as our liaison to the board for now. <laughs> Maybe future board member. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> <That's... laughs> <laughs> I'm on mute. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't, I didn't hear you. I, I have no questions, but I want to thank Ms. Shaw for the uh, thorough presentation. And I have no questions either, but I just want to thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all the work that you do with the council. Every year is incredibly important to the seniors in town of Arlington, but this year, much more than others. So I appreciate the work that you do, and nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, ready? And with that we will move on to the next applicant. Do we have anyone from the Fidelity House? All right, Miss Lisa Urban. Okay. 
Ms. Urban, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yep. Can you hear yep. me? We can hear you now. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I, I'm Lisa Urban. I work at Fidelity House. And I thought it was important to give an overview of our outreach program. Fidelity House runs year round for the families that reside at Minami Manor. But now I'm also thinking it's pretty important to be brief. So uh, first of all, I just want to say um, this year, thank you for the funding for this year. It was probably the most important year to still offer as much as we could. And I can honestly say that I have seen the most positive visible changes in the shortest amount of time for the kids. And we couldn't have done it without the funding from CDBG. Uh, just a quick overview of the program. I know most of you are aware of what we run, but um, not everyone is. Uh, we offer a year round program for kids that reside down at Manami Manor, their families, um, day camp. They come to day camp. We provide transportation there and back every day for them to get to camp um, from their house. Uh, then during the school year, normally we offer free memberships and also um, an on-site program and scholarships to any of the programs that we run here. This year we had to modify that extremely a lot. So instead of the, we don't have a drop-in program at the moment. So the kids are now getting phased into our daycare program, our preschool, our pre-kindergarten, whatever programs are running right now, we're getting them involved in that um, until we can resume what they're used to. But it's uh, been a challenging year, but an awesome year. And the CDBG funding is so important to this programming. And I'm hoping moving forward, it's gonna be available. And um, just on a side thing, we also offered, uh, we're part of the Jobs, Jobs, Jobs with mainly for our day camp. Um, we have high schoolers that work here and learn how to work with kids and get training um, during the summer. But those kids that have worked, have worked out great every year. And, you know, they've come back year after year and um, tried to work as long as they could in between sports seasons. So I hope that continues too. And thank you for pulling it out this long evening. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No problem, thank you. Mr. Zikorsi? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman, no questions. Thank you, Ms. Urban, for, for hanging in there with us this evening too. It's, it's, a, it's a late night and we appreciate the work, uh, the important work that you're doing. Thanks. Mr. Carroll? No, I have no questions, but th th thank you for the work. It, you know, like so much of what's brought forward uh, is particularly important this year. Appreciate it. Mrs. Mahan? Uh, no questions, and similar to my colleagues, I want to thank Ms. Urban and her colleagues for the invaluable ser service they provide down the Fidelity House, and um, we're so fortunate to have you doing that. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? Um, no questions. I echo my colleagues. Thank you. And I have no questions, and as a former Fidel kid, I thank you for everything that you did for me and the kids of Arlington and continue to do so we appreciate the work all right and hey, now thanks for hanging in there with all the meetings <laughs> no problem thank you good night evening is young <laughs> <laughs> we just want to finish today all right so next is the sum of all homeless coalition so if, if we can promote mike libby Mr. Libby, can you hear us? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Could you just tell us a little bit about your request. Sure. And um, thank you to the select board and town manager uh, for all your hard work and the opportunity to uh, for the Somerville Homeless Coalition to apply for CDBG funding this year. My name is Mike Libby. Not, not only am I the executive director of Somerville Homeless Coalition, I'm also a lifelong Arlington resident, resident and live on Hillside Avenue. Um, 
this year, while the Somerville Homeless Coalition has uh, partnered with Arlington for decades in terms of providing uh, different services for homeless prevention, housing, and uh, outreach to um, the street homeless. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the first time we're applying for CDBG funding to help support the work that the Somerville Homeless Coalition is doing for the unsheltered residents of Somerville, in particular, those that are um, staying out in the encampment at the Mugar Woods area, but we've also worked with other folks that have been living in their cars behind different storefronts um, down Mass Avenue and whatnot. One of the things that um, happened a couple of years ago is the Arlington Police Department applied for a grant through the state called the Rapid Transition of Homeless Individuals Program, the state program through DHCD. And it was funded uh, fully to provide not only outreach to the folks uh, living outside in Arlington, but also resources to provide housing and um, tenancy stabilization services once they were moved into housing. Uh, we were asked a couple of years ago to join those efforts uh, with the health department and the police department. And we've been doing it um, ever since. And you know, it's what we do, we love it. We have a great staff um, that has had great success uh, with the program the last couple of years, um, we have moved people into housing, about 10 different households into housing uh, over the course of that time frame. And uh, we continue to go out there three times a week uh, with Officer Joe Kniff, who's our uh, homeless outreach um, officer through the, the police department. Um, unfortunately, the state uh, started a great program and then decided to cut it in half for us. Um, so we lost about half of our funding for the program as of June 30th of uh, 2020. Um, so we are coming to uh, the town of Arlington and in particular the CDB, CDBG program to ask uh, for um, part of the funding necessary to not only continue the outreach services that we do um, to the folks in the encampment and uh, that are homeless in other areas of Arlington, but also to continue to provide the support to those that we've already moved into housing to help them you know, remain successful in their housing so that they don't have to return uh, to that situation. Um, and it was very unfortunate because I feel like it's been a very successful program that the state ended up cutting it um, and making life more difficult for us. So uh, we really you know, enjoy partnering with, um, with the town on this effort. And as a Arlington resident myself, I feel very passionate about um, what we're doing uh, to help the folks down, um, down at Mugar. You. And Mr. Carroll? I have no questions. Just thank you very much for what, you, what you're doing. It's, uh, it's such important work. Ms. Mahan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Summerville Homeless Coalition. I know that myself and my colleagues have certainly availed us of the opportunity for Arlington residents during the uh, COVID crisis, um, along with yourself, some of the homeless coalition, Chief Flaherty and uh, Officer Joe Kniff um, that have helped quite a few residents um, that I know I've been involved with and I know my colleagues have been involved with others. Um, and uh, regarding uh, the Mugar homeless um, encampment, um, you all have been in an invaluable service in the past and as well as we, we believe in the future in terms of um, balancing um, the Mugar site and the homeless people that are out there. And um, I don't know how we accomplish any success without the um, partnership between the town of Wellington and the Somerville Homeless Coalition, because you recognize the fact that there's a lot of factors playing into each individual, um, not only in terms of circumstance and happenstance, but uh, mental health issues. Uh, and that's something that you really need expertise to kind of work through the waters of that. And we're very fortunate to have you all. So um, I applaud you and thank you for your application. I thank you and my colleagues for your previous efforts in that and you're continued in the future and hopefully anything the town of Arlington can do to encourage and um, facilitate that um, we'll, we'll be able to do in the future. But I, I don't want to say it just to say it, but 
you're definitely an invaluable resource uh, uh, for every person that you touch. So I appreciate it. And thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll echo a lot of what um, Mrs. Mahan said. Uh, and, you know, the more I work with Somerville, uh, folks in Somerville on other issues, I appreciate how lucky uh, we are to be right next door to um, Somerville. Uh, I, I want to reread your application. I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to get in touch with you later right. you know, and, and discuss uh, your, your, um, the work that you do and other things that can possibly be done. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, and Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Libby, for the uh, presentation and for all the work that, uh, that you've done. And, and we've had uh, several discussions over the past few months and I've seen firsthand the great work uh, that you're doing there with your team and uh, yourself, Hannah O'Halloran and, and, and others. And it's uh, really just a great partnership with the town, both the Health and Human Services Department and the Police Department. So thank you for that. I, I do have one question on the the funding that you talked about that is going away was, and I see in your application, there's fifty two thousand dollars listed there. Is that the DHCD, DHCD funding that is, will um, has gone away as of last June thirtieth? Yes, it's a separate line item within the homeless individual uh, budget line item uh, within the state, and it's um, through DHCD, and that's the one that's been that's been cut. Okay, no, that's unfortunate. Okay, thank, thank you again, and, um, and and keep up the great work. Thanks, Mr. DeCourcy. And thank you for the presentation. I know it's been a difficult year for all, but I, I know you rely on a lot of fundraising and funding that sources that haven't been available. So I, I hope we can help you out here to do great work for the town, and I'll start training for the 5k for next year so you can resume that and hopefully it's in person <laughs> <laughs> i don't know all right I can all right thank you everybody my time. thank you all right so that takes us to the rec department mr chaplain i don't do we have any friend we do have someone from the rec, yeah, rec department all right mr villet Everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. How are you? Good, how are you? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Zachary Viette, and I'm the program supervisor for the Arlington Rec Department. I started in the role back in March, so this is my first time presenting to the board, so it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, so each year, Arlington Recreation uses the CDBG funding as part of our scholarship program. With that, um, we tried to provide as many individuals in the Arlington community from low to moderate income housing, uh, the opportunity to do a recreation-based program. Uh, as far as an update for the current fiscal year, the department was awarded uh, $6,200. We are currently after quarter two, uh, about halfway to that goal, um, providing just over 22 program scholarships to 12 individuals. Um, in terms of the request for fiscal year 22, we are looking to request $13,000 in funding between fiscal year, um, excuse me, fiscal year 2015 through 2019, the department has traditionally received um, an award of $13,000, which has been applied to the scholarship program. That amount decreased um, in fiscal year uh, 20 down to 12,400. Um, and then again, last year at a 60, 6,200. Um, the hope and with the increase in requests is to again, provide as many families in need as possible with the current times with COVID. Uh, we, we think that the increase in the number of families in town is gonna go up um, with the amount of individuals that need help. Um, currently just looking at our, our programs uh, upcoming as Mr. Pooler stated earlier, we are scheduled to do a full slate of spring and summer programming um, and that includes summer camp. So fingers crossed, stay hopeful. And you know we've been running programs since the later end of the summer. So 
this funding is, you know, so important just over kind of looking back over um, before me what the department has done over the last seven years or fiscal years. Uh, we've done over $108,000 in uh, financial aid. Of that, $83,000 has come from CDBG funding and then about 25,000 of internal scholarships. So um, there is always a need um, and we hope that this funding can help those in need and you know have the opportunity to uh, get as many individuals into our programming as possible. Um, just wanna thank Ms. Sullivan for all the hard work and thank you all for having me tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Nicorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Vayet for the um, presentation and it's first time seeing you so welcome and uh, um, th thanks for the, uh, the the programming efforts there in, in challenging times. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. I'll also just say thank you and welcome. I, I have no specific questions. Thank you. Dickens. Thanks and no questions. Mrs. Mahan. I, you're still on mute, Diane. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I just want to say thank you and welcome to Ms. Bayette um, for uh, the information you provided to us and what you're going to do in the future. And I do not have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just say thank you and welcome. And sorry that I butchered your name at the beginning of the process, but I'll remember it from this time forward. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next, do we have anyone from the Arlington Disability Commission or DPW for the curb cut ramp project? Oh, Ms. Chaplain, do you wanna just give us a brief idea of what that is? Yeah, so that's an annual recurring project that um, is, is designed to meet the goal of eventually upgrading all of our, uh, of our curb cut ramps to being ADA accessible. So they cost between, uh, believe it or not, about three to $5,000 per ramp based on the engineering and all of the materials. So um, based on that funding amount, um, you know, we, we get an amount that we can get done based on the actual cost and the contract we let. Uh, but the goal is to make, again, uh, every curb cut uh, ADA accessible across the whole town. Thank you. Any questions from the board on this one? No. All right, so the next one is Foodlink. And then I see we have Deanne DuPont. Ms. DuPont, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right. You want to just tell us about your application? Sure. I will tell you a bit about, um, well, first I want to thank uh, the board. Thanks, everyone. The board, the staff, volunteers, and recipients. We're very grateful for the past several years of support to Foodlink. And because without this support, we would not have been able to purchase and renovate what we're calling the Food Link Hub. And I'd just like to share my screen for a moment here, um, if that can be abled. Just check on it. Um, Are you able to now, Dan? I can. Okay. Um, can you see the old yes, we can. store? Okay, yep. great. So I just want to just show you really quick the, the transformation that we've done, and it is because of the CDBG grant. So this is from the west side. We're almost completed. We sh sorry, that went a little faster. Uh, can I share again? Oh, what? There. Okay. Um, so, is it sharing or no? Not now. Oh, share screen. Now it is. Yep. Okay, um, so here it is from the west side. Oh, 
Well, I might just have to. Um... Here's from the west side from the loading dock. This is from the east side over here on the east side, you can see the ramp. And then here it is from the front and we plan to occupy it next month. So that was just a, a brief um, overview there. And uh, with this, we're gonna be able to provide more food to Arlington programs. Uh, we also are providing, uh, since last year, we've created three new jobs and we anticipate creating two more jobs this coming year. And as the food insecurity has increased in both Arlington and Massachusetts, we have also increased the amount of food we've been able to provide to folks as uh, so the state doubled as so did we double the amount of food we're providing. For this past year in Arlington, we serve 6,000 unique individuals and of which 3,600 met the HUD eligibility requirements or 60%. The programs that we served um, that were not shut down during the year included Arlington Mutual Aid, Caritas Community Housing, who you heard from earlier, Arlington Eats, Monotomy Manor, Chestnut Manor, Cusack Terrace, and we've developed a partnership with Minuteman High School, whereby we are taking donated food there to their culinary department. This is fresh food and various other ingredients. And during the week, the students create meals and side dishes. They then package them, label them, and freeze them. And when we um, go back the following Monday to drop off more food, we collect this food and then we distribute it to our recipient agencies. A significant amount of those meals are going to Chestnut Manor and Cusack Terrace. We're very uh, proud and excited about this initiative. We also receive a grant uh, to fight food insecurity in Arlington and we're using those funds uh, directly for the work that we're doing with Chestnut Manor, Monotomy Manor and Cusack Terrace. Our request for this coming year is once again for the facilities and it's to install a natural gas fire generator, which will help us to keep, it will service the walk-in cooler, internet and some power in the main floor. So if there is a disaster that hits Arlington or there's a, a huge power failure, we'll be able to continue to provide services to Arlington and ensure that people who need food get food. This was actually in our grant request for last year, but because of uh, cost overruns with the facade and such, we put it towards phase two. But what we did do during phase one is we put in all the infrastructure for the generators. So all the conduits and piping and that sort of thing. So it, it's fairly ready. We're also requesting funds for additional filtration system. So we will have new HVA system, a VRF system and, a, and a, some mini splits. But it's not, uh, there's additional filtration system that we can add to the building as well to make it even safer for our staff and volunteers. And that's the end of my presentation. Sorry for the technical difficulty there. No problem. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? No questions. Thank you. And I look forward every time I drive by Summer Street to see the progress that you all have made. And God bless thank you. you. Well, thank you. Mr. Diggins? Uh, thank you very much, Sweet, and I want to express again my appreciation for the tour that you gave uh, myself and Mr. Kiro uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, and I really am impressed with the work that you're doing with um, Minuteman uh, Tech. I mean, that's a really great program. Quick question, though: I mean, um, are you finding it harder to get food now that businesses are, I mean, that with the, the pandemic and patterns of behavior changing? Yeah, so, so what we did is we pivoted fairly quickly. So our model changed a bit. We were dealing mainly with grocery stores, but now a significant amount of food is coming from wholesalers. So we actually go up to New Hampshire to get food. And we also work with the, uh, the Chelsea Produce Market and uh, other wholesalers. We still do our traditional food rescue from places like Wegmans, Whole Food, Trader Joe's, Costco's and places like that, but we've expanded significantly. We, we've also uh, expanded our fleet of vehicles. So we have three cargo vans and we'll be getting a refrigerated box truck, which is through funding through the state. So then, so then okay, that's fine. I, I got all the answer I needed. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Mr. Carroll? Thank you very much. Always incredibly detailed. Um, 
uh, applications. Um, and I'm, I'm just always in awe when I think of what Food Link has become in, in just nine um, short years. So uh, mm -hmm. really appreciate it. I also appreciate uh, having the opportunity to tour facility. And I think that was a month ago, so I can only imagine what shape it's in now. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Mr. DeCorsi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Grant. I, I want to echo my colleagues. I, uh, I may have been a little earlier on the uh, on the tour, and I was impressed at that point now with the uh, facade and all the outside work that you're doing. It's just remarkable. And uh, um, it's just so impressive, everything that 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 you and your team have done and, and um, how the programs have, have grown. And um, th thank you. And, and thank you for the thorough presentation and, and application. Sure. And thank you. And thank you for all that you do for the town. All right. You're welcome. And we'll invite Mr. Hurd and Mr. Mahan, uh, Ms. Mahan as well for tours. Sure. It's on my, oh, it's my list to uh, to reach out to you. So sure. thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. And do we have anyone from Envision Arlington? For the annual Arlington Town Survey. Then the only other group that I have left is the planning department. Ms. Chaplin, does anyone from planning want to present on the request? Mallory is still on with us. She may want to share further or she may tell me that um, we had Erin earlier. She's no longer here. So I guess if, if Ma Mallory may want to share further or, or not. Okay. Mallory, is there anything additional that you want to talk about for the request for planning? Um, not uh, unless there are any questions um, from the board. The um, I spoke to the economic development program, which our department is overseeing, um, and um, there's nothing further at this time. But if um, happy to take questions. All right. Does not have any questions on the planning request. No, thank you, Mr. Carroll. No, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. No questions. And Ms. Stignitz. Um. No questions on the planning part. I mean, just curious about with the, the survey though, I guess it's part of Envision and, and so maybe you can't answer this, but how is it that that ended up getting funded by CDBG? Um, sure, so it is, um, it falls under the, uh, in the planning and administration component um, of, plan of CDBG. Um, there's a section that's dedicated to um, uh, planning studies and such. So it does fall within the planning and administrative cap. Okay. Um, gotcha. Thank you very much. It's still, it's still um, when we look at the, um, the census groups, um, it does reach all of those that qualify as low and moderate income as well. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. If I could, Mr. Chairman, um, I think um, we have a request from Lauren Ledger from Arlington Eats. Just a sort of brief um, comment you'd like to make. Yep. So we're gonna we're through all of the applicants. So now we're gonna open it up to public comment. So as I was gonna ask anybody that would like to speak, use the raise hand function. And I see Lauren's with us. Hi everyone. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Um, Lauren Ledger, our LinkedIn Eats board member. And um, my board just asked me to stop by and say thank you to you all for the three different grants that we were awarded last year. EBG. Um, we were awarded a $332,000 fit out grant for our new home on the first floor of 117 Broadway. And if you haven't had a chance to drive by that, I would encourage you to do so. It is coming along swimmingly. Um, you know, COVID has shown us how incredibly imperative it is for us to have a space of our own so that we can expand our hours to reach more Arlington residents, to expand our services, and also really excitingly to expand our partnerships and to offer space to a lot of the organizations that you heard from tonight and um, other groups such as SNAP and WIC registration, fuel exists, assistance, affordable housing, financial counseling, immigration. We really hope this is a hub for a lot of different places needing services in Arlington. 
Um, our building and construction schedule will allow us to be in our new space sometime this fall in 2021. And we are well on our way um, to raising our, our $1.25 million goal for the completion of our project. We're not applying for a grant this year because we have really seen the, the generosity of the community. Um, in terms of our two other grants, the um, program support and the COVID-19 support, all of that, every penny went to food for our home delivery system. Um, as I'm sure you all know, we moved to a completely delivery model where we are delivering upwards of 290 families per week. Um, and that amounts to about 9,000 pounds of food being processed and distributed every week by um, volunteers and our staff members. So thank you. It was good to see you. Um, and I am not envious of the hard job you have this year of awarding these different grants to all these different organizations. Thank you, Lauren. All right, if any other members of the public would like to speak to any of the requests, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application right now. All right, and with that, we'll take a motion from Mrs. Mahan. Um. So move, move receipt of the performance update for CDBG for program year 2020 to 2021, as well as, unless Attorney Hine tells me it has to be a separate vote, um, move to receipt, receive the request for 2021-2022 CDBG funding. Yes, yeah, Mr. Crow. Any additional comments, Mr. DeCorsi? No comments. Hey, Ms. Diggins? No. We have a motion to receive by Ms. Mahan, second by Mr. Curl. Attorney Hine? Mrs. Mahan. Sorry, yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Curl? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Chaplain, this is not the um, the vote yet uh, that, that you would participate in, right? Correct. That that's the final vote recommending in the town meeting. Okay. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. And that closes our public hearing. <clears throat> Takes us to item number ten on the agenda: Co appointments, Council on Aging. We have Sheila Connery and Laura Lissio. Term to expire. 131-2024. I brought both of them forward, Mr. Chair. And thank you for sticking in with us on this. Usually appointments come about 10 minutes into the meeting, so. Oh, <laughs> just wondering. All right. All right. Ms. Connery, if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve on the council on aging? Sure. Um, Sheila Kinerney, I'm a nurse practitioner and I work in geriatrics. Um, grew up in Arlington and I'm living back here now as uh, an adult with a child in the school system and looking for a way to give back uh, to the community right now. Um, and I thought that maybe my, you know, my background as a nurse would be helpful and Shedding some light on, you know, things that would be useful for the Council on Aging. Thank you. And I will just turn to the board with any questions. Mrs. Mahan. Sorry, that mute button gets me every time. Um, I just want to uh, thank um, Ms. Kernarni as a big nurse practitioner mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, Volunteering your time with the Council on Aging, is, is, as you know, it's something that's really important, especially during COVID-19. We need all the expertise that we can get in terms of um, not only educating our seniors um, and other uh, adults, development, disabled adults, but also um, 
having the expertise to make them feel comfortable um, to speak to professionals like yourself. So I'm, I'm very thankful and grateful that you, you've agreed to do this and we probably couldn't afford you or pay you to do it. <laughs> so I do appreciate you volunteering to do this. And I know it's um, out of your compassion and your vocation that, that you've committed yourself to. So um, I, I want to thank you very much. And um, I believe we might be doing these one at a time. So I'd like to move approval on Ms. Canary's um, appointment to the Council on Aging. And yeah, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second the motion and thank you, Ms. Canary, for uh, your willingness to serve and uh, the, the expertise that you will uh, to bring to this position. And uh, my apologies on behalf of the board for making you wait a long, around so long. This is like the final test to see if you were, were willing to serve. So th thank you very much. No problem. Mr. Diggins. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, you're, you're definitely qualified. And uh, I have to say, I mean, I'm really intrigued by that um, Rebecca Colvin Prize for Ex Exceptional Scholarly Project um, oh, yeah. back in May 2005. I mean, that is a, a really interesting um, piece there. I'd like to learn more about it. I mean, oh, so yeah. if it's like something that you can email me or something, I mean, I'd appreciate it. You can find my email address on the um, the select board's webpage. So, um, sure. But, um, welcome aboard. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Carroll. Th thank you very much. I'm happy to support the motion. Um, I think if you heard Ms. Shah's presentation, you got a little bit of a glimpse into some of the work, the important work the Council on Aging does. Um, I have had the honor for the last couple of years of uh, sitting in as the liaison. You've got a great group you'll be working with, and I'm sure you'll be a fantastic addition. So good luck and thank you for your time and service. Thanks. Thank you again, as you said, because of Carlton on Aging does so much important work for the town, particularly this year. But my grandmother actually was on the Council on, on Aging until she was about 90 years old. So it's very important to, to my family. So thank you for your willingness to serve. All right. And that will take us to Miss Licio. If you just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to serve on the Council on, on Aging. Yes, yeah, so thank you for having me and um, nice to meet you all. Um, I am originally a social worker. I'm an LICSW, but my work in social work was mostly in leadership capacities for community-based services and statewide services and programs. Um, mostly for um, the Medicaid population. Um, but then I fell into managed care contracting um, in my career. And I did contracting for ancillary and community-based services. So mostly for Medicare and Medicaid uh, recipients. Um, and mostly for um, the elder population. So I know a lot about um, home care and hospice and skilled nursing facilities, for instance. But then in later years, I also um, worked for organizations in managed care that um, serviced um, individuals who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So, and the over 65 population being senior population and the under 65 being um, mostly a disabled population. So I have retired from my full-time position and um, do some consulting work periodically. I've always wanted to be um, on a board. Um, so I saw this advertisement and thought that it would be great to um, give back in my own community and service the senior population. So, um, I'm very excited about this opportunity. Yep. Yeah. And Ms. Mrs. Mahan, 
if you can amend your motion to include Ms. Lichio, we'll take one vote. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to amend my motion um, to include Ms. Lichio. And um, I am generally in awe of um, working with our seniors um, in terms of services we can provide them, but also educating them and um, being able to walk them through what they see is very difficult and they are very difficult steps to uh, help them get the care that they warrant and deserve. So I appreciate you giving back to Arlington this way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Corsi, if you can confirm. Thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second uh, the uh, amended motion and uh, thank you, Ms. Lozio, for, for seeing the ad and responding to it. It really, uh, it's one of the things that makes this town community so great is that people step up and, and offer expertise in different areas. And uh, we really appreciate you doing that with the Council on Aging. Thank you. Mr. Carroll. Thank you very much. I think you uh, probably heard what I said just a couple of minutes ago. Um, I, I think your, your uh, management and uh, social work background will be real assets to the to the council. So thank you. Thank you for stepping up. Mrs. Thank Higgins? you. Yeah, in my opinion, I mean, social workers are the real heroes in our society. I know a lot of other professions get that you know, accolade at times for me, but you all do I mean, work day in and day out. That is just really hard. I mean, really benefit society and uh, <laughs> you're underpaid. I mean, so you don't really need to give back. I mean, uh, we need to give to you, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Again, thank you for your willingness to serve. Congratulations on your retirement. And we're glad that we now get to enjoy your services as a result of that. So thank you both. All right. So. Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Janana spoke. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. We have an appointment to the Grants Committee of the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture formerly Arlington Cultural Council. Todd Brunel, term to expire in January 31st, 2024. Hi there. Hey, how are you? You can just tell us a Good. little bit how are you doing? and why you want to serve. <clears throat> yeah, I'm a professional musician and educator. My name is Todd Brunel. Um, I was asked to join the Arlington Cultural Council at the behest of uh, Susan, um, whose name I can't think of because it's just too gosh darn late right now. By the way, is that a, is that a Stratocaster in the back there? It is. It is nice, nice. I don't know if you can guitar. tell it. It's a lefty. Wow. One of those weirdos. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, well, I'm, I'm mainly a clarinetist sax player. I'm a full-time uh, teacher with the Boston Public Schools. Um, and uh, I've played here and there and everywhere and uh, continue to do so. It just seems to me that the Arlington Cultural Council is a, is a really great opportunity to um, connect with other artists and musicians. And, um, and I'd, I'd, I'd be delighted to, uh, to serve. Um, and, and, and as I was sitting here waiting for my time, I was going through the more than 300 pages of, of grant applications that were sifting through right now uh, so it's an important job and what we're trying to do i think you know in 2021 we're hopeful that the pandemic is going to end and we're going to have uh, a rejuvenation a revitalization of our of our arts and culture in arlington so I'm, i'd be very excited to uh, be a part of a team that would would be uh you know paramount to that kind of thing so all right thank you mr diggins Thank you very much. We look. I'm. I'm going to. I, I will motion to. Um, I guess what we should do. I'm sorry. I got a little bit confused. Me. Uh, so. <laughs> so so we, we. Yeah. We. We've done. We've done the other one. The other couple. So. Um, so yes. I. I will motion to. Um, uh, approve you for the position of. Um, uh, grant. Um, uh, Grant uh, advisor, grant um, committee. grants committee for the ACAC. You know, uh, so um, 
Uh, but uh, but with that, I mean, I, I read through uh, your um, your application, you know, or or your your resume. I see a, a lot of music, you know, but uh, but experience. <laughs> you've done a lot of music. You've done a lot of things, but uh, but experience with um, grants. Yeah. So I, I've 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 been a I'm I, a 2020 uh, grant uh, award winner from Arlington, actually. Um, so I, I do have quite a bit, quite a bit of experience writing grants and receiving grants. I've gotten them from Somerville and Cambridge and um, Arlington in the past as well, um, and then grants from from other places that have uh, really enabled um, performances to happen. You know, these these grants are really important. The other thing about the grants, and I told this to the committee, like if, if you get partial funding, just getting that little stamp of the Arts Council is really good to get additional funding from other sources. If people see that you are, you know, it's like sort of a stamp of legitimacy, right? So, so it's an important thing. Um, I have, I have never worn the, what they call the golden handcuffs. So as a musician, I've, I've worn a lot of different hats, uh, as a, a director of, of a, uh, of a performing arts series called the Vortex Series for New and Improvised Music, um, being an ensemble director, and and I've also been head of music at private schools and so forth, where I've I've had to do a lot of writing and organizing, and arranging, preparing for concerts and so forth. There's a lot, a lot of work uh, behind the scenes as a musician. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You don't just practice and prepare for concerts. You have to do all the business. So I'm kind of used to that kind of thing. And thanks for enlightening me you know, about that. But I, I trust me, the folks who have recommended you. So it was easy for me to make that motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah. And I'll happily second the motion. It, it's, uh, I was thrilled to see that you had applied for this, Todd. Um, I know uh, Mr. Brunel does a lot of the music support at my uh, parish, but he, he recently um, did a phenomenal uh, video musical collaboration with our uh, town's poet laureate as well. So uh, is, is quite steeped in, in, uh, in, in a lot of what's going on in the uh, art scene here too. So I, I know you're the real deal, Todd. So uh, I'm very happy to second the motion and, uh, and uh, to um, <clears throat> see other ways for you to share your talents. With us. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Mr. Jacorsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Brunel. I, I, I see that you're already attending meetings and, and um, helping out with the, um, the grants committee. So thank you for that. And it's nice to see a, a former grant recipient give, give back. And, and I know you've given a lot to the community and um, um, appreciate the, your efforts. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Ms. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Mr. Burnell is my daughter who is a uh, music theory, Northeastern. Oh yeah? Former student. Um, uh, also, I, I have the poster in my room back there. She was uh, the first opening act for Amanda Palmer. <laughs> so I definitely- Oh wow, have that's, that's a big deal. That's a true story. I got the poster for it, so. Um, oh, awesome. But I, I definitely appreciate um, what, what you're going to bring um, to this committee, not just with uh, Boston Public Schools, Middlesex Community College. One of the things I, that I'm really impressed with that I know you definitely go ab above and beyond with is um, your music on the hill in Belmont, Mass. Um, I kind of Googled that a little. And my big thing is I'm a coach of cheerleaders, which is not a coach of music. Um, but it is a coach, so I have a little mano y mano with you, and um, I, I'm definitely uh, aware of and thankful uh, the work that you do with students in encouraging them um, along this venue. And I know you'll bring this to this committee, not just to students, but to adults here in Arlington. So um, I'm definitely appreciative of that. So I'm, I'm happy happy to join in this motion to approve you. Thank you very much, Diane. All right, and thank you for your willingness to serve. I know you'll do great things for the arts community in Arlington. All right, Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Carl. I just want to know if the saxophone is the best instrument, so I'm down with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guitars. Yeah. 
Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Brunel. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, that takes us to licenses and permits for approval. Food vendor license, Domino's Pizza, 671 Massachusetts Avenue, Eunice Caracas. Ms. Caracas, can you hear us? Hello? Hi, we can hear you now. Yeah. How you doing? Hey, thank you for sticking with, with us this late. If you could just tell us a little bit about your application. Yeah, sure. So my name is Yunus Karakos. So I have been working with Domino's 11 years. So I have an opportunity to purchase the Arlington Domino's right now. So I managed six different Domino's visa in the city, city of Boston. So I'm so excited if I have this opportunity. So I'll try to my best service for Arlington, best pizza, best product. Sure. So I'm so excited. All right, appreciate it. And Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move approval subject to all conditions uh, contained in the package uh, regarding the application. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? I'd like to second that and thank Mr. Ms. Caracas um, for her application, her maintenance plan, and all the information that she's um, sent to us concerning of hours of operation and the uh, not only maintenance plan, but um, other plans that she's included. It, it's a very comprehensive app application. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carroll? Uh, just to echo our, our late colleague, Mr. Greeley, thank you for choosing Arlington. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Mr. Diggins? I'm all set. If it passes, Mr. Mrs. Mahan, I know it's a good application. We're all set. All right. And thank you for choosing to invest in the Arlington community. All right, thank Attorney you. Hunt, I forgot your name. <laughs> we have a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Yannis Thank you, Ms. Parkes. Thank you very much. Sorry, sure is getting late. All right, that takes us to our open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall need to be acted upon, nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. So at this time, if anyone would like to speak during Citizens Open Forum, if you use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. All right, we have one. All right, we can promote Sarah Burks. Great. Ms. Burks, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you see me? Yes, sir. Again. If you could just say your name for the record. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah Burks. I'm appearing before you this evening as a representative of the Board of Trustees of the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum. The trustees would like to speak in support of agenda item number 13, the Arlington Human Rights Commission's resolution in recognition of indigenous people in our community. And we support the designation of the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day. Cyrus Dallin was born and raised in Utah before moving here to pursue his artistic education. He witnessed indigenous people in Utah dispossessed of their land and exploited by the US government. This knowledge affected both his art and activism. 
Throughout his life, he actively listened to and learned from the indigenous people around him. In 1931, he told a group of white Boston University students, our race has been one of the most brutal of any in establishing itself and the great story of the United States will always rest on the blackest page of history. Last summer and fall, the trustees spent many hours discussing, discussing social justice issues in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. We formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion subcommittee to develop new organizational goals and a formal statement for the museum. We have actively been pursuing a number of initiatives including partnering with the Massachusetts tribe on a land acknowledgement statement for the museum. In October, we collaborated with the Arlington Human Rights Commission on a panel discussion about Native American imagery in society. And we are embarking on a learning journey during which we will engage in conversations with BIPOC artists, curators, and cultural leaders develop a better understanding of DE and I issues as they really relate to museums. Dallin valued knowledge, empathy, collaboration, and equity. These values are important to the Dallin Museum and to our community. Dallin died 76 years ago, but sadly many of the systems of oppression that he spoke out against still persist today. The Board of Trustees is proud to speak in support of this proposal as a very small way that we can recognize the perspectives and rights of contemporary Indigenous people seeking recognition and equity in our community. When Fairies Gray, Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog, spoke at a program about the Indigenous people of Monotomy, he was asked what the Arlington community could do to support the Massachusetts tribe. And he replied that we could stop celebrating Columbus Day. It's really that important. Thank you for your time and attention to this important issue. Thank you. And the next speaker is Heather Lavelle. Think her remote, Ms. Lavelle. Ms. Lavelle, if you can just say your name for the record. Yes, hi, this is Heather Lavelle. And I would too also like to express my support for the proclamation to rename the second Monday of October to Indigenous Peoples Day in Arlington. And I'm speaking to you tonight as a co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm a second generation Italian American. I live and work on the ancestral land of the Massachusetts tribe. Um, and Italian Americans for Indi Indigenous Peoples Day supports the efforts of Indigenous Peoples Day in Massachusetts, and you'll be hearing from them today. Our members are residents of Arlington. Some of, some of our members are residents of Arlington. We believe that a holiday that celebrates the resilience of Indigenous peoples is far more truthful and reflective of our values than one that honors one of history's greatest villains. We have listened to the voices of Indigenous peoples and learned the complete history of Christopher Columbus a man responsible for the genocide of the people of the Caribbean and the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade. Some Italian Americans claim that the holiday is not about Columbus. It's a celebration of Italian American culture. And if, if this isn't about Columbus, then it should not matter that the name has changed, especially considering that there are ample opportunities to celebrate our culture throughout October, which is officially recognized in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as Italian American Heritage Month. For some Italian Americans, the holiday commemorates a time when our ancestors overcame terrible ethnic and religious discrimination and became fully accepted into the dominant white culture. We empathize with those who feel that the prospect of renaming Columbus Day means the loss of the hard fought acknowledgement that we deserve to exist in this country. But things are much different for us today. Our culture is celebrated. We enjoy status and recognition in society. These are not privileges afforded to native people. We have a responsibility to use our platform we now have to ensure that we are not repeating the same patterns of abuse that our ancestors endured but it's important to make a distinction between past discrimination against Italian Americans 
and the settler colonial violence, enslavement, dispossession, and exploitation perpetrated against thousands of diverse groups of Indigenous people with their own unique and distinct cultures over the course of centuries. Also remember that Columbus was purposely introduced and firmly embedded in our country's founding mythology long before Italians came on the scene. It's time for all of us who are part of this country's dominant white culture to take collective responsibility for the events of our past, for the false and incomplete telling of our history, and for our misplaced adulation of Columbus. Indigenous peoples are presenting us with a wonderful opportunity to take a first step toward healing and reconciliation. And I ask that you please open your hearts, listen to their voices and honor their wishes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I don't see any additional hands raised. And that will close our, our open forum. Now lost my agenda, but I do know that the next agenda item is the discussion in request for proc proclamation for Indigenous Peoples Day. We have Jillian Harvey, our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We have Hina Jolin from the Arlington Human Rights Commission, and Drake. Pusey from the Arlington Human Rights Commission. I believe we're gonna start with just Drake. Okay. Yes. Um, hi, the, I'm gonna be as quick as I can, but this is super important. So I wanna give it the time it deserves. The purpose of this proclamation is to support indigenous peoples in Arlington and Massachusetts. So I'm going to give a super basic introduction. You've already heard from way better historians than myself. And above all, I want you to hear from two Native American residents of Arlington. One um, who I hope she's still on, um, it's pretty late. Marui Monroe is the leader of the United American Indians of New England. And Danielle Cost is a Algonquin resident who you have heard from um, in a few uh, community forums at this point. Um, one way we heal from horrifying events is by combining uh, sort of a somber remembrance of the past with uh, appreciation of the present and optimism and hope for the future. And we do this on various anniversaries already like Pearl Harbor Day, 9-11, or more positively on Juneteenth and on moving observances like Memorial Day. Indigenous Peoples Day is just such a holiday um, as you know, it replaces Columbus Day. Columbus was a controversial figure. I, it's true as a sailor, he was brave. As a businessman though, he was exploitative. And as a governor, he was despotic, cruel and abusive, even to his Spanish subjects. It wasn't just a you know, old fashioned notion of race. Uh, Spanish historians are still to this day uncovering firsthand reports in the Queen's archives as recently as 2005 of atrocities he committed just across the board. But most importantly, um, his rule was detrimental to the indigenous peoples leading to slavery and near total genocide in the Caribbean where he landed and later across North America. Unfortunately, he is the precedent for that. Um, and that's why the HRC is asking for this proclamation to change Columbus Day, change, refocus the celebration to uh, the survival and persistence of a culture and heritage that we very nearly lost and need to support. Um, I would like mm -hmm. to have you hear from Danielle Cost, please. Okay. Ms. Koss, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you for sticking with us. <laughs> well, I have to say I'm that. i see how the sausage is made for sure. Um, good evening, members of the Arlington Select Board. My name is Danielle Cost, and I'm here. 
as your neighbor to share my perspective about Columbus Day. And as you can see, it's very personal. As Drake mentioned, I'm Algonquin. I'm an enrolled member at the Kittagon ZB First Nation in Canada. My mother and family still live on the reservation where I spent much of my childhood. First Nations are what Indigenous people are called in Canada as the first people on this land. And by land, I mean even here in Arlington, where I'm now living and raising my two children. Tonight, I'm asking you, sorry, and our community to think about what it means to be Native American, to fight to be seen in a world that has been trying to erase you for more than 500 years, to live in a society that thinks it's honoring you with sports mascots and give, instead of giving you basic respect, to have to seek recognition and validation for your very existence. And most of all, I would like to share my family's story and the pain that we suffered at the hands of Canada's re Indian residential school system, which was a government effort to assimilate native children that happened not only in Canada, but in the US too. In 1955, the government forcibly removed my mother and her siblings from their parents and sent them 1100 miles away. They were among thousands of native kids who were systematically stripped of their identities, their religion, their language, and their family structures were broken and they were severely abused and neglected. My mom was four when she was taken, I mean, which is two years younger than, than my daughter, which is, just blows my mind. And she was gone for 10 years, but she's one of the lucky ones because hundreds of children didn't survive. As my mother's daughter, I feel compelled to share her story because many people aren't aware of this history and they're, they're always shocked that it happened not that long ago. Um, and some, might li some listening tonight might think, I'm sorry that this happened to your family, but what does this have to do with marking Columbus Day in Arlington? And it's this, recognizing Indigenous People's Day is a step toward healing for Native people. It's a meaningful acknowledgement, not only of our history on this land here in Arlington, but our fight to be seen as people today. Thank you. Thank you. I am told that Madawi is no longer available tonight, unfortunately. Okay. Um, She's still on the Zoom. Is she? Is she? she should, should I try to? Come yeah, up? why don't you pump her up and just see if maybe she's available? And if not, no problem. <clears throat> Ms. Monroe, can you hear us? We'll leave her there, and if if she's able to join us, she can jump in. Um, do you do you have any additional comments before I read the requested proclamation? No, please go ahead. All right. So we have a, a proclamation request submitted by the Human Rights Commission. And it goes as follows: Voted that the town adopt the following resolution, whereas the indigenous peoples of the lands that would later become known as the Americas and specifically the Massachusetts tribe in the lands which would later become known as monotony from an Algonquin word have occupied these lands since, since time immo immemorial. And whereas the town of Arlington, Massachusetts wishes to honor our nation and our in town's indigenous roots history and contributions, and whereas the cultures of the indigenous peoples of the Americas are worthy of being promoted, their history is rich, diverse, and worthy of celebration, and whereas the actions and policies of European colonizers of the Americas actively destroyed and suppressed parts of those cultures, and racism has served to perpetuate high rates of poverty for ind indigenous peoples, and led to inequities in health, education, and housing, as illustrated most recently with the severe impact of COVID-19 on indigenous communities. And whereas the town has a history of opposing racism and prominent residents throughout history, such as Cyrus Dallin, were particularly active in advancing the rights of indigenous peoples. 
Whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in Geneva in 1977 by a delegation of native nations to the United Nations sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. And whereas in 1990, representatives from 120 Indigenous nations at the first Continental Conference on 500 years of Indian resistance unanimous, unanimously passed a resolution to transform Columbus Day into an occasion to strengthen the process of continental unity and struggle towards liberation and thereby use the occasion to reveal a more accurate historical record. And whereas the District of Columbia, states of Alaska, Louisiana, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, New Mexico, Oregon, South Dakota, Vermont, Wisconsin, in localities including Somerville, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Brookline, Massachusetts, Newton, Massachusetts, Marblehead, Massachusetts, Northampton, Massachusetts, Amherst, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, Los Angeles, California, San Francisco, California, Denver, Colorado, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Columbus, Ohio, and many more have adopted Indigenous Peoples Day as counter celebration in lieu of Columbus Day to promote Indigenous cultures and commemorate the history of Indigenous peoples. And whereas Columbus Day commemorates the landing of Christopher Columbus in the Americas, specifically on the Caribbean islands of the Bahamas on October 12, 1492, and later on Hispaniola, present day countries of the Dominican Republic in Haiti, and voyages of Columbus to the Americas initiated the transatlantic slave trade in the era of conquest. And his governorship of the Caribbean instituted systematic policies of slavery and extermination of indigenous populations, especially the Tano, Arawak people, whose population was reduced from approximately 8 million to 100,000, being further reduced by the continuation of his policies until near extinction in 1542. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the select board votes to proclaim that the second Monday of October shall be commemorated as Indigenous Peoples Day in Arlington, superseding local references to Columbus Day in, in recognition of the position of Indigenous peoples as native to these lands and suffering they face in the suffering they face during the and since the European conquest and be it further resolved that the people of Arlington as well as local businesses organizations and public institutions are encouraged to observe Indigenous Peoples Day by reflecting upon the dispossession of the homelands and villages of the Massachusetts people of this region who lived here for millennia prior to the arrival of European settlers, and upon the history of other indigenous peoples who have lived in Arlington, and by celebrating the survival of indigenous peoples and recognizing their struggle to perpetuate and celebrate their ancestral heritage and practices, as well as celebrating the thriving cultures and values that indigenous peoples have brought and continue to bring to our town and the wider community, and be it further resolved that in any observances, Arlington shall endeavor to include indigenous representation from amongst its residents and from the Massachusetts tribe, and will also seek representation from indigenous organizations in such area as the North American Indian Center of Boston, United American Indians of New England, Cultural Survival, and Indigenous Peoples Day Mass.org as well as other Arlington community representation from segments of the community, and be it further resolved that the Arlington Public Schools are encouraged to join in this observance with appropriate exercises and or instruction in all schools around the time of Indigenous Peoples Day. To the end that the culture, history, and diversity of Indigenous peoples be celebrated and perpetuated, and be it further resolved that local businesses, organizations, and public institutions are encouraged to evaluate their imagery and insignia to ensure that representations of indigenous peoples are not misappropriated with a preference for using the town seal in official capacities and be it further resolved that all town entities are encouraged to celebrate and recognize the heritage heritage of the peoples indigenous to Massachusetts and Arlington by including the following land acknowledgement at the beginning of all of the town's public meetings. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe 
the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. And be it further resolved that it is requested that the town clerk ensure that the Massachusetts Commission of Indian Affairs, North American Indian Center for of Boston, Indigenous Peoples Day Mass.org, United American Indians of New England, Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness, and the Massachusetts Tribe of Ponkapoag, Mashpee Wampanoag Indian Tribal Council, the Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Head, Aquinan, the Nipmuc National Tribal Council, including the Hassanamisco of Natick, the Asanit Band of Wampanoags, the Chappaquiddick Wampanoags, the Chabanua Gungamag Nimuk, the Pocasset Wampanoag, the Herring Pond Wampanoag, and the Seekonk Wampanoag, all of which include descendants of those people indigenous to Massachusetts, as well as the Arlington School Committee, Arlington Advocate, and yourarlington.com receive electronic or paper copies of this resolution. So that is the resolution as requested. I will turn to the board. Mr. Crow. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. You seeking a, a motion for approval of the proclamation is read. Yep. I, I'd like to make make that motion and uh, just just say a few words. I mean, it's um, it's time to do this. I'm I'm glad that uh, Ms. Burks and and uh, Ms. Lavelle did kick in. I know they came in on on uh, on open forum. Um, and gave us a little bit of the history. Um, Mr. Crow, can I stop you for one second? Yeah. Does Ms. Monroe want to speak? It looks like she's with us now. Oh. Drake, does Ms. Does Ms. Mon Monroe want to speak? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, my name is Matoe Monroe. I live in Arlington. I'm co-leader of United American Indians of New England and also founded Indigenous Peoples Day, MA.org, which is a statewide effort to bring Indigenous Peoples Day to Massachusetts. We've worked to help bring forward Indigenous Peoples Day resolutions in cities and towns from Cambridge to Newton and Marblehead, Brookline and others. And um, as some of you may know, we also have a statewide bill for Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous people have been asking since the 1970s for the day to be recognized in order to educate the public about Columbus and about the indigenous past and present of where they live. Because often non-native people still seem to think that nobody lived here until the Europeans came here and very often even think that we're extinct. There's not time tonight for me to talk about the crimes of Columbus and his men. Celebrating Columbus erases centuries of indigenous reality it's an effort to silence us and to make us invisible. It has a terrible impact, not only on our kids, but frankly on non-native people and their children to pretend that it's all right to continue to do this. It makes it easier for non-native people to marginalize and ignore us when we talk about our history and current issues, such as our high rates of COVID deaths, the thousands of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, and tens of thousands of our people in, in this country who still live without safe drinking water. Indigenous Peoples Day is a positive celebration of the tribal nations from here, such as the Massachusetts, Nipmuc and Wampanoag, and people from hundreds of other indigenous nations who live in the area, whether Maya or Mohawk or Mi'kmaq or Lakota like myself. It's also an opportunity for others to better appreciate how we can all become allies in breaking down the remaining cultural and institutional barriers of discrimination. Many institutions in town talk about diversity, yet indigenous peoples have somehow usually not even been mentioned or acknowledged in the past. So I'm asking for a change and we're asking tonight for the support of every member of the select board. As was the case with other civil and human rights matters, such as bringing down the Confederate flag 
and instituting marriage equality. Maybe not every single person will understand the need for this despite all our educational efforts, but tonight we are counting on you to listen and understand and do the right thing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Carroll, you continue? That's quite all right. So I, I just put a motion out and I was saying that I, I agree that I think this is, um, th th this is time uh, to do this. Um, you know, we have a lot to celebrate in our country. Our, our, our president just uh, nominated for Secretary of the Interior, the, the first Native American uh, to lead a cabinet level agency, Congresswoman um, Holland from uh, New Mexico. But here in Arlington, I mean, we have a special connection. I mean, we hold up the name of, of Monotomy, which is the, the original um, uh, uh, indigenous uh, name for the land that, 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 we, um, that, that we occupy here today. And we also, <clears throat> I'm glad that Ms. Burks and, and Ms. Lavelle um, spoke a bit because um, we also you know, cherish the contributions that Cyrus Dallin get to our community, but we have to recognize that Cyrus Dallin in his day was, was a, um, a great ally of the Native uh, American community at a time when that was not, um, not easy and not uh, popular. And I think uh, we could do, um, you know, we, we should not do less. Um, I, I've been told that I'm the first member of the select board to have an Italian name, although I know I'm not the only member of this board who, who has uh, Italian roots. Um, and I, I feel like it's, it's a false conflation when, when, um, uh, when uh, the idea of Indigenous Peoples Day is, is criticized as somehow a, a uh, besmirching of, of Italian Americans. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm also a... Um, uh, second, I guess, second generation um, Italian. My great grandfather came here. Um, he worked in the mines of uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania for almost a decade uh, to, to earn enough money to bring his family over to, uh, to this country. And I want you to hold that image in your head for a second. Because I, as you know, uh, two years ago, my daughter and I took a, um, a religious pilgrimage across Spain um, <clears throat> along the Camino de Santiago, and many of the churches there were built at the time of Columbus. You remember that Columbus was essentially a mercenary working for the Spanish kingdom at that time. You go into a lot of the churches that were built then, and they're, they're at first glance, they're beautiful to the eye. But then you think deeper about all of the souls that, that suffered to mine that gold. So the difference between my great-grandfather and those who were enslaved by Columbus and those who, who came after him is that he had a choice. As hard and difficult as it was, he had a choice to come and, and, and uh, mine the earth of, the, of, of this land. Um, but, but others were, um, were compelled. Um, I think it, it makes great sense for us to, to, to hold up the indigenous peoples of our area and of our, of our, of our nation. It's, um, it's, long overdue, um, it, it, it's, it's uh, long overdue. And, um, you know, my own employer made the switch on, on our, our official calendar and it was, you know, without a lot of ado because it was just the right thing to do. And so uh, I, I, uh, I hope that uh, to receive a second to the motion and I hope that we'll support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I'll second it, you know, and and I'll, I um, I have uh, three or four questions, Mr. Chair, if I if I may, and um, so um, um to any um of the um, the the three that are here with us, you know, um, so what was the the origin of Columbus Day? How did it come to be celebrated? Madhui, would you like to answer that one? You have a deep historical knowledge.
I'm still muted. Okay, thanks. Columbus Day has been celebrated since the 1800s. It was put forward at a time when a lot of national U.S. myths were being put forward. Um, you know, the, the, we have a lot of myths in this country, such as George, that, that some of us grew up with, such as George Washington never told a lie, and um, about the pilgrims coming here to Massachusetts and Columbus was part of that too. And it was a myth intended to create a sense of national unity among white people. Certainly it was excluding everyone else. Um, and then it was embraced by some Italian immigrants in the 1900s as a sign of pride and especially as a way of showing that they were American too, at a time when Italian Americans were in fact facing a lot of discrimination, facing a lot of prejudice um, as recent immigrants and as being considered at that time, not now, but at that time, as being less than white <laughs> as well, uh, you know, and facing, facing a lot of discrimination. So they embraced it and it, it, it became a federal holiday. Uh, the problem with that, like so many of these national myths, is that it it number one, ignored the history. A lot of the history about Columbus was not known at that time, um, but we do know the truth now and we've known the truth for a very long time. And indigenous people in particular have known the truth for much longer because it's something that, you know, we, we've always been very clear that we had civilization and we had spirituality and we never needed to be discovered by anybody. And Columbus was an uninvited guest. And um, unfortunately, like this, so many other elements of national mythologies, it excludes indigenous and black and other people. Um, and, you know, I think now in 2021, we're all sufficiently conscious to know that we need to get rid of that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is a, a quick question to uh, maybe the, the chair and, and uh, uh, Maybe even the, the folks who have um, uh, come to this proclamation. Is it all or none um, of this proclamation? And um, is, is there any editing that can be done? So this is a pro proclamation request. So you can you can request an amendment to the proclamation. Okay. All right. You know, so um, the, the question. So um, is it Indigenous peoples, uh, it, that uh, the, the notion is that um, the land belongs to no one. That 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 all the or it belongs to everyone. I mean that there's this sense of ownership of land is 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 just not part of what it of what should be. Am, am I right about that? I don't quite understand your question. So, so the question is, me. so so the there is some culture. I thought it was indigenous peoples that that feel that the the notion of owning land is 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 anathema. That that there's no such thing really as owning the land. I mean that the land belongs to all of us. Is that so? Yeah, I'd like to clear. I, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Thank yeah. you. Um, we don't have that. We did not have the concept of land ownership in the form of deeds and titles and things like that. There was no registry of deeds here in Massachusetts when the Pilgrims landed. That's for sure. But certainly, we had territories, and various tribes and bands of tribes had their territories that they that they hunted on and lived upon and moved around upon. And um, those ancestral territories. Um, the land and the water and everything that lives there are places where we have relationships and we believe that our lives depend upon those relationships and our spirituality is based upon those relationships as well. So while we don't own the land, we are the caretakers of the land and we continue to be the caretakers of the land. Gotcha. Okay. I understand. And, um, so, so yeah, um, I understand. Okay. And, um, so it, I um, I understand where we're coming from on this, I mean, and and I think it's a really, it's a, it's a step forward that I I want to see us take. I mean, I generally am a, a 
both and kind of person. And um, and so, uh, and I could appreciate me that me, <laughs> I could appreciate how that would come across as very offensive to to someone who feels me that that me, the putting the two together mean uh, is just not acceptable. Me. I would like that would be my preference me for to be indigenous peoples uh, and Columbus Day or or slash Columbus Day and, uh, uh, but I don't think that's going to really be an option here and, um, uh, but I will say the the, um, the the encouragement to have a preamble to every meeting in um, especially uh, yeah, is is it problematic for me? It, uh, it, I, I feel that it, it's it's headed down a road where it, you can either end up with a, like a long opening to the meetings, meet uh, 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 or it's like, well, what else should be in this? We, in, and so I would say if we were going to do a preamble to the meetings, we, I would like to see a, a much more inclusive uh, preamble. Uh, and, uh, uh, but a, my inclination would be not to have the preamble to meetings. You know? So um, I'm not going to make an amendment at this point, but I'm gonna reserve the ability to do so. Uh, so that's it for me, thank you recommendation. All right, Mr. DeCoursey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you for, for the comments this evening. And, and I, I support uh, Mr. Kira's motion. I, I do understand that in terms of the exact language, um, you know, there, there may be um, things that other members of the board would like to discuss prior, prior to town meeting. One question I do have, and you mentioned the the effort at the state level. And, and one of the reasons why there's Columbus Day in Massachusetts is because the legislature passed chapter six, section 12B, which is the Columbus Day um, proclamation that the, the governor is asked to, to issue every year. Um, what, for other communities, if, if, if you're aware, are, are, have you asked for any requests of state uh, delegations to, to support the, um, changing that, that statute. I know there was a bill in the last session that was entered in the House. I, I Representative Rogers supported that bill, but it didn't, it didn't come out of committee. So do you view this as a separate lot, effort on the state level versus at, at the local level? Uh, we introduced that bill in the last session and we'll be reintroducing it in this session on both the House and Senate side. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, Representative Jack Lewis will be the lead sponsor and we have several other sponsors on the House side and um, Senator Comerford will be the lead sponsor on the Senate side with other sponsors as well. So yes, we are trying to do it on a state level too. But meantime, um, there are many towns that are interested in doing this. I think more and more people have come to realize that it, it's a problem to continue to celebrate Columbus Day, a very clear problem. And uh, you know, luckily, thanks to the work of Black Lives Matter and, and, and many other people, I think there's more consciousness of these types of issues right now, in addition to the work that we're doing. Absolutely. No, thank you. And, and question for, for Mr. Pusey. I, I understand there's also a warrant article for town meeting. Is it the same proclamation that would be put before town meeting or that you're proposing to put before town meeting? No, we submitted four articles today. We're trying to make them complementary, not duplicative. And we did talk to um, town meeting moderator, John Leone to um, discuss the uh, land acknowledgement issue. And he said, you know, if you wanted to make that a strict procedure, that's a whole bylaw issue. Um, if you want to recommend it, you can do, you know, the resolutions are non-binding, right? You can have a resolution in support of it, but to actually make the land acknowledgement would be something you would do during the announcements portion, um, whether um, one of you would volunteer to do it or one of us would do it. Um, but the other articles involve 
Um, there's a resolution for uh, the land acknowledgement. There's a resolution in support of um, Indigenous Peoples Day. And then there are two bylaw amendments to um, replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day in the bylaw listing the holidays and one to add Juneteenth, which has been passed as a state holiday in July. Okay, no, th thank you. And, and um, I, I, like, like I said, I, I support um, the, the motion. I do have some questions in terms of the, whether the land acknowledgement is a, it should be separated from a, a resolution for Indigenous Peoples Day. I know that in many other communities, that there is a separation uh, of that, and it, you know whether it's part of an equity plan or whether it's part of a, a custom and practice at Winchester, for example, um, their, their land acknowledgement is the first meeting of every month for this select board. Uh, for, for example, other communities, it's the opening session of town meeting. So I, I wanna hear from, from other members, but I, I think, and we'll see what the level of support is, but I, I do want you to know if, if their exact language isn't adopted this evening, it's, it's really maybe because there's some changes that need to be made, not, not what the, um, the gist of the resolution is, but there may be some, some things where we're just seeing this um, that, that we may wish to discuss. So thank you. This is Mahan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, definitely support the motion um, claiming that the second Monday of October shall be commem commemorated as Indi Indi Indigenous People Day um, and what follows therefore. Um, in terms of uh, land statement or any preamble for the before the select board, um, I would agree with my colleagues that including Mr. DeCourcy, that's something that um, I think we need to sp spend some more time um, investigating. Um, I think the, the crux of this is um, my daughter Rebecca was going into teaching as a vocation and she couldn't follow through on that. And one of the big um, reasons for that was some of the things that she would have to teach which also scoped around Columbus Day. And it really hurt her heart and didn't allow her to go on to be certified as a teacher because she did not feel she could conform um, to talk about Christopher Columbus and Columbus Day when all of the uh, atrocities were uh, taken in against indigenous people here in America or what was what is now known as the United States of America. So um, I definitely support the motion. Uh, I think we need to have more conversation like everything else that's going on here in the US um, for good, bad. Um, it, it's something that definitely needs to happen and is going to allow us to heal, move forward and find the right thing to do. So. Um, I, de I definitely support the motion made by my colleagues that Columbus Day, formerly Columbus Day, um, on the second Monday of October, now be known as the Indigenous People uh, Day in Arlington, Massachusetts. And we can continue this conversation like other conversa conversations that we have had and will continue to have. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Trying to embody our former colleague, Mr. Dunn, who is good at amending language on the fly. Um, thank you all for presenting. I think this is something that is long overdue in the town. Um, it's This is true of many, many localities, but our town certainly has a rich Native American history and something that we celebrate. And I think this is one way to, to support the Native communities that were here before us in do whatever part we can, take whatever steps, steps we can to right or wrong. Um, so I'll support the motion. And, you know, I think, again, this is 
glad to be a part of this and glad to have a vote in on this particular item and you know it, it's a like it's a proud day for the town the town is always embodied diversity and tolerance among race amongst races race amongst races and i think in the past few years we've really stepped that up and this is just a continuation of that um i think you know i i don't have any issues with the the language but I do understand the concerns and I, I think if we were, this is just an encouragement. I think this will come to the next level. This is a proclamation request. So if we looked at the language and said something to, to the, in let me, my colleagues can tell me if this is what they're thinking, but on the last paragraph regarding the land acknowledgement, something along the lines of resolve that all town entities are encouraged to celebrate and recognize the heritage of peoples indigenous to Massachusetts and Arlington. And by including a land acknowledgement at the beginning of designated town public meetings in a substantially similar form to the following with the language provided. If that's what I think our colleagues are looking for that will open the gate to say that we support the institution of a land acknowledgement before public meetings. It doesn't have to be specifically this one, or it doesn't have to, I, I think Mr. Dagan's concerned that every public meeting could be over encompassing. I think it, as with this conversation continues, we can really determine the appropriate times for the land acknowledgement and exactly what it has to say. So with that, I will revert back to my colleagues for any additional comments. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, th th thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. I, I'm happy to amend my motion as, as, you've, um, as, as you have suggested. I, I know that for a lot of folks, land acknowledgements are, a new, um, are new for them. I mean, I, I, I know that, um, <clears throat> you know, I was recently delegate to my day Austin convention. We opened with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, and, uh, but I, I think that um, uh, the, the changes that you've suggested will, will allow us to, to, to work with the various uh, committees and, and uh, bodies in town to, to appropriately incorporate this into their proceedings. And, um, and um, you know, while still providing this language as the reference point. Mr. Diggins? Yeah, it's getting there. I mean, you did a good job, you know, but, you know, it, 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 I guess my, my feeling is that, it, it, um, we, there are lots of things we can acknowledge. I mean, uh, we can acknowledge me that the economic vitality of this country is built on, you know, in slavery. It, and so I, I, I just feel that it, um, it's the, the intention is good, you know, for these acknowledgements. You know, uh, I feel that to a certain extent, we we already have that in that a a person, the chair running the meeting, you know, can can pretty much acknowledge whatever they want at the beginning of the meeting that they're running. You uh, know, uh, but I'm I'm not going to get in the way of this. You know, I think you made a really good. Adjustment to it, and, and I can support that. And I've had my say. Thank you. I would just say again, it's just it's an encouragement. To, yeah. And I, I think what this is doing is opening the conversation. Mr. Yeah. Curry. Mr. Curry. No, fine. You 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 took the words right out of my mouth. All right, Mrs. Corsi. Anything additional? Uh, nothing additional, Mr. Chairman. And Mrs. Mahan. Uh, move or approval. So we already have that by, by Mr. Carl. All right, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. <clears throat> yes. Sorry. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. So you nice vote. Thank you all. I'm glad we could get you out before midnight. Thank you for sticking with us. All right.
lost my agenda again. Okay. All right. So next item on our agenda discussion or attorney Heim, do we need to take a vote to extend the time for the meeting? Probably. <laughs> Mr. Curry, do you want to set a cap for us? Sure. I think we were supposed to take that vote quite a while ago. Um, I, I will uh, move the the um, the the rule uh, to, to twelve. Uh, sorry, before I put the loud yawn there. <laughs> Ms. Vaughn? Second. Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. Yep. yep. I apologize. Mr. Chairman, is there any other administrative matters that, that the board wants to address right now? I, I hate to suggest this. I'm just aware that there's still a fair amount on the agenda. If there's any items that the board wants to postpone, and I'm with you till the end, no matter what. We're here till one, that's fine with me. But if, if there's anything the board wants to postpone, uh, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd respectfully submit that now is probably the time to at least take a look to see if there's anything that the board believes uh, can or should wait. So we have town finance department, which I assume is quick. Very quick. Mr. Diggins, we have your warrant article. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that up tonight? We, we, we need to between the warrant filing deadline. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I was muted. So, so yeah, I think it can be, I think that can be quick. All right. We have updates to the Mugar site, um, which I spoke to Mr. Corsi about. And do we want to continue with that tonight? Well, the, the thing on that, there's a couple of actions that are going to be requested on that. If, yeah. if the board feels like this is going to take a while, it, uh, we can take that up at our next meeting. It's not time sensitive. It, it's time sensitive in that we're going to propose putting something before the zoning board, um, but they are not going to be done with their work before the next meeting. So if, if, if the board wants to continue that discussion, um, I think we could. I'd like to do it tonight, but I, if, if, if there's a um, the rest of the, the board would like to, to do that one, maybe that one is, is up for being moved. Briefly, yes or no? On Mugar, Ms. Diggins? Um, hey, I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to change the time. I'm going to work tomorrow. So yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Mr. Carroll? Let, let, let's plow through. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a suggestion on one of them uh, on how to streamline it, one of the ones before that. So, yeah. Okay. Mr. Mahan? I think we're here for a while, so we're going to have to keep trudging through. So I'm, I'm just hoping that we can kind of be a little more expeditious than we have been. But I think we need to definitely unmute our. I hate to see that go away. All right. Ms. Mahan, did you second Mr. Carroll's motion to take us to midnight? Sorry. Yes, unfortunately, I do. <laughs> just I've never expected. I would say. Yeah. Okay, is there, was there a second, Mr. Hurt? Yes, Mrs. Mahan. Okay. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Shakiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. All right. All right. Attorney Heim, for discussion and vote, town finance bar. All right, the really short version of this is that um, you see in the memo that we, uh, pass some special legislation that uh, allows for the town to create a municipal finance department. Uh, the town manager has the authority to appoint a finance director. He's uh, done so in the form of Mr. Pooler taking on that role in addition to being deputy town manager. Essentially all we're looking for here tonight is a vote confirming that the select board wants to create a finance department. It's my understanding that uh, this is the first year that we're planning to report uh, in our annual reports as a finance department. I know Mr. Chaplain has anything to add, but I think you've got a motion in front of you. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. We have a recommended motion by- So moved. In the language from Attorney Heim. Second. second. Ms. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Carroll. Mr. Corsi, any comments? No comments. Mr. Diggins? Nope. Mr. Chaplain. 
Doug, Doug said it all, and this is simply voting to confirm what's already in place. It, it, the departments are functioning like a family. Attorney Hunt. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Carroll. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. All right. I, I know it's a theme. Draft one article on the creation of a committee to explore creating a young a youth and young adult committee. Mr. Diggins. Yes. So so um yeah, this is something that um, I would like to see uh, the town um, town meeting own. Yeah, I know that there's the ability to create something. Sorry about that. You know, gosh, he lost a couple of sentences there. It, this is something that uh, I know that the board could create itself. I mean, but I'd like the town town meeting to um, own it I mean, because I think it'd be much more meaningful if uh, it was the creation of town meeting and town meeting had a real uh, role in the creation of it, meaning that it would help determine what it looks like. I, mean, I could have my sense of what uh, representative using Young Adult Advisory Committee uh, Board of Commission would look like, but I'd like to get the input from a lot more people um, as to what this should look like. So so I guess there are two things me that I would like my colleagues to consider. And that is one, whether this is a good thing to have, period. And then secondly, me whether the creation of it should be done me by town meeting, for, by means of a uh, way of ex by means of exploring exactly how it should be composed. Mr. Carroll, thank you very much. Um, this is the one that I was talking about um, having a suggestion on how to streamline this, given the late hour. I, I would like to move that we uh, support the insertion of a warrant article to, to this um, to this this end on the warrant. But, but substantially parroting only the, the first paragraph with it or take any other action related there too. And, and then um, because that, that should give us the opportunity then during the hearing time to decide the question that Mr. Diggins just raised about whether or not we should go forward to town meeting with this and um, the devil's in the details. And I, I, I suspect it'll take us some time to hash through the membership on this. So if, if there's a formulation like that that works, I'd like to move that we just insert this, place us on the warrant um, at the board's uh, board's request in, in that formulation, and then we'll, we can hash out whether to go forward and hash out the details um, during the hearing process. Okay. Mr. Diggins, second the motion. Yes, I'll second it. And and I and a brief after a brief conversation with town council, me, I felt that was the right thing to do too. I uh, I I submitted this before I talked to town council, and I wanted to err on the side of doing too much work for this rather than too little. Uh, it'd be easier to pull back some of it than to go, well, you're missing a lot. So thank you for that friendly amendment. Mrs. Mahan. I I agree. Um, I think. The second paragraph has some really ambitious um, suggestions that we need to investigate whether there's actually interest there or a regrouping, reorganization of that part. So I agree. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree as well. All right. Me as well. Attorney Hyman. Mrs. Vaughan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Carroll? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. All right. I know 16 discussion updates to the Mugar site. Um, we had inserted this, and I, think, I believe Attorney Heim has a presentation. So, this is really a point to just have a little discussion about the new proposal and you know, just reiterate our comments regarding the proposal to the ZBA and the proponents. Attorney Adam? Adam, if you give me the opportunity to share a screen, I'll, oh, there we go. So folks, I'm gonna try to run through this at warp speed. Um, some of this is, is, I think, primarily for the, the public's education more than the board's, but I just wanted to, there's a few things that I wanted to highlight and I'm, I'll skip through a lot of stuff. Um, I just wanted folks to know as a baseline and a refresher here, 
uh, this all started on May 19th, 2015. And some of the things that the select board has done since then is you had a site visit, you held special hearings, you retained experts for early peer review, which is uh, something you're allowed to do, but it's an extra mile that the board went. You appointed a special counsel um, and you urged Mass Housing to deny site approval by two letters, one in August of 2015 and a second supplemental one in October of 2015. Unfortunately, uh, Mass Housing granted site approval in May of 2015. After that, the actual application was filed on August 31st, 2016. Did you presentation bug? What's that? Presentation mode, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Um, apologize, let me see if I can get this. No problem, well, if it's a hassle, don't worry about it, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, um, you know, the select board noted its uh, opposition to the initial application uh, after it was filed and then supported the ZBA's assertion of safe harbor status on uh, October, in October of 2016. Uh, thereafter, the ZBA uh, initiated an interlocutory, I'm sorry, asserted the safe harbor status, litigated at DHCD, uh, took an interlocutory appeal in December of 2016, uh, subpoenaed records and litigated with uh, DMH and DDS um, such that uh, this interlocutory appeal uh, didn't actually have hearings until January of 2019. And it wasn't until October of 2019 that the HAC found for the applicants on Safe Harbor. So again, I just want folks to re remind folks of all the things that this board has, has done and has been doing as well as the ZBA. Um, uh, relative to this this matter and leaving no stone unturned, which was the clear directive from this board. Once the substantive hearings resumed uh, on December 10th of 2019, this board renewed its opposition, provided further comment. The ZBA uh, retained peer review experts, including uh, using any supplemental funds uh, that this board urged town meeting to adopt, which town meeting did appropriate. The applicants first submitted a mildly revised proposal in uh, March of 2020. There were further comments exchanged and received. Um, and um, that's really when the substantive hearings on specific topics, traffic, parking, uh, engineering, uh, started uh, taking hold. Uh, the proposal was then revised a second time, even more substantially in November of 2020. Uh, and here's sort of where the proposal lies now compared to the original proposal. So the original proposal was for 219 units. The new proposal is for 176. Most of that is the product of eliminating uh, these two family townhouses that they had uh, proposed to build. Um, there's a reduction in the overall size of the building. Um, and the probably most significant piece uh, otherwise is that most of the parking has been moved underground. So the work yet to be done is that substantive hearings on specific topics continues to be ongoing. There's a hearing tomorrow on architectural design, for example. The ZBA has to consider and incorporate further comments. They have to complete peer review on allowable subjects. I'll touch on that in a second. Then they have to render a decision within 40 days of the close of hearing. The thing that I really want to emphasize mostly for the public, since I think the board understands this well, is that the decision has to be really carefully crafted. The board has three options. It can approve the project, it can approve the project with conditions or make changes, or it can deny the project is not consistent with local needs. The real problem in terms of just a public communication is that denials are really disadvantageous. When you deny something, um, the majority of denials are appealed and the majority of those appeals are upheld. I mean, the majority of those decisions are reversed by the HAC. And the HAC um, ends up granting the project sort of carte blanche rather than uh, uh, following the conditions that you might be able to impose uh, with an order with conditions. Uh, the further work to be done if necessary is prepare for any appeals within 20 days of the decision. So when zoning boards grant an application with conditions, they're frequently appealed by the applicant to the HAC. They're appealed by the abutters or both. 
And then after that process, which can take quite some time, uh, another potentially six to nine months, we also have to prepare for subsequent litigation. So the ZBA can appeal the HAC decision if the HAC doesn't support its uh, order. And a butter can appeal the HAC decision to court. The applicants can appeal the decision to court as well. There's also um, some other additional things that I think are particularly germane to raise, uh, given what I've uh, heard and observed at a lot of hearings. Um, the Conservation Commission still has to have a hearing on the application of the Wetlands Protection Act, even if um, an applicant basically has a comprehensive permit. There may be certain circumstances in which something called a MEPA review has to be conducted. And then of course there's building permitting uh, on conventional issues. A very brief context, mostly for the public again, is that laws, regulations, and, and facts have to apply as the date of the filing of the 40B application, which is all the way back in 2016. The average time from an application to a decision is 10 months. Uh, obviously here we've been uh, more than four years out from the date of the application and almost five years uh, from the site approval notice. A little asterisk sort of indicate that there's not a lot of studies on these things. Um, I'm basing this on some studies that were done by the MIT uh, Center for Real Estate. Uh, the study's a little old though. 80% um, of projects are approved by the zoning boards, um, but even an approval has to be carefully crafted because any conditions that are uneconomic, uh, quote unquote uneconomic, basically uh, gives rise to a likely further appeal. Again, denials are disadvantageous, and I would go into this in more detail if it weren't so late, but it's really important to understand that this statute was not passed to give local control. It was passed to basically circumvent local control in most circumstances. And then finally, orders with conditions have to be sustainable. If you uh, put it in an order with a condition that uh, is outside the scope of what you're allowed to consider in a 40B, uh, you're basically giving the applicants a uh, avenue for appeal that will um, uh, potentially give them again the carte blanche uh, that might be might result in a, a worse version of the project. Uh, only about 10% uh, percent of projects proceed to further litigation. That means after the HACC appeal. Um, but to be frank with all of you, that's, that's probably a, a good possibility in this circumstance in any number of, of, of circumstances given how controversial this project is. It's really important to understand that the HAC rarely rules in favor of zoning boards on substantive grounds. All right, so this, uh, a lot of this study was done uh, in the uh, early to mid 2000s, but the decisions from the HAC recently have only been uh, more evidence that, that the HAC is not a friendly forum um, for, uh, for, for municipalities. So some of the things that the select board can do, uh, I, I wanna talk about in just a second, but I wanna just again, highlight for folks what the select board has done. The select board opposed project eligibility the select board hired and retained peer review at the earliest stages of this matter, uh, which is uh, unconventional, but an aggressive maneuver. The select board secured support from its legis legislative delegation, retained special counsel, requested and received supplemental funds to help the ZBA render the best decision it could, it can, um, which has included second round of supplemental funds. It's opposed the original project in hearing. It opposed the revised project. It also, uh, uh, authorized uh, me uh, and directed me to try to explore negotiations with the landowner, which have not been fruitful. Um, your options going further uh, forward are to obviously further comment on this again revised project, continue to support funds for um, both the ZBA and subsequent litigation, and to support the assertion of the ZBA's right through any appeals and litigation. And I, I just want to touch on something very briefly. I want you folks to know that. Um, you know, the special counsel on this has been indispensable. So any decision that the ZBA drafts will be reviewed uh, by um, Mr. Haverty, uh, who's a counsel that we have through a grant, as well, of course, as Mr. Witten, who uh, is the special counsel that this board um, uh, advocated for and has helped to make sure is, is funded. So their perspective is in line with mine, which is that what we want is a decision that's going to uh, put the ZBA in the town in the best possible position. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive though, because while the best possible position might appear to be, let's just reject this whole thing outright, rejecting it outright uh, uh, 
will almost certainly mean that uh, we would lose in the HAC and uh, you would end up with, uh, again, forgive the colloquial term, but sort of carte blanche for the applicants. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry that was a shorter version of, of, of it as I could, but I wanted to make sure that you folks uh, had a, especially folks watching, uh, or maybe we'll watch later, had a firm ground. All right, I'll go through the board for any comments or motions. I believe, Terheim, we sent a letter, was it back in the last summer or a year ago? I believe it was last summer after the uh, first revision uh, in March of yeah. 2020. So I'd seek board comments on any revisions or if the board would like to direct me as chair to work with Attorney Heim for an updated letter, which we can either send to the ZBA or bring back to the board at a further meeting for approval. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. I am going to talk as slowly as possible in case I start to say something that would be detrimental to the town um, in terms of our position on this. Um, my concern is regarding um, the town's position and trying to think of the right way to say this. Um, I understand that the, the history that has gotten us to the point that we have, um, we have had attorney Heim and then as a outside consultant attorney Whitten, uh, I would like the chair to um, investigate uh, with the town manager and attorney Heim about perhaps uh, employing or hiring as a consultant in this phase, attorney Wooden to advise us. My big concern is um, my perception of, I know the board uh, with the advent of Mr. DeCourcy reaffirmed our vote um, regarding the oak tree proposal at the Mugar site and how uh, in terms of environmental, economical, pu public safety, educational, it would be extremely detrimental to the town, but um, I am concerned about what I perceive the town strategy to be in terms of what the town does or does not do or what the town weighs or lays at the feet of a, a butter um, court filing. I, I'm going to turn to our attorney Heim here because I, I want to say more, but I don't want to say anything that's detrimental to, to the town. But my 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 concern is that I, I am perceiving that the town strategy is we kind of have to lay down. We we can't do anything because HUD is in a real court. They're going to go for Oak Tree and the developer, and our real case rests on um, the abutter. Uh, court case um, and that's where we need to hang our hat on and I'm hoping that's not the case. I'd like to see something that, that the town um, should be do should be doing whether it's um, and I understand you know you brought up the highlight the legislative delegation with all due respect they really had nothing to do with um, where we are with Oak Tree and Mugar. Um, so my big concern is I, I I'm getting the impression that um, we're real, we, the town, are really not doing anything, and we're, we're kind of laying this on the backs of a of an umbrella suit. And what can we do instead of just having that as our major legal um, philosophy? Mr. Chairman, yep. So, um, so. Just to address one thing first. Uh, so Mr. Whitney is, is, is still on board. Um, he's still our special counsel. He still uh, advises uh, the ZBA and um, I can certainly uh, have Mr. Whitten uh, come to a select board meeting uh, if you'd like uh, for certain. So he's, he's still very much a part of this team. And um, I think what Mr. Whitten would say is that um, at some point the town has to, the ZBA has to issue a decision. 
And the decision, uh, the sort of squeeze point that 40B puts on us is that, uh, and again, just for just be very clear, because I, I appreciate your concerns, uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan, about just the sort of general tenor of the discussion, is that this is within the ZBA's purview. The ZBA is ultimately the one that has to make this decision. Uh, the select board as the chief elected body here is talking about something that's of great concern to the town and its residents. And I think it's uh, fine and appropriate that the select board uh, expresses its concerns and wants to have sort of updates uh, and clearly understands that the select board isn't trying to intrude upon the ZBA's uh, process in an inappropriate way. Uh, but the, the ultimate dilemma for the ZBA is that they have to issue a decision and the statutory scheme doesn't incentivize them to uh, issue a denial. A denial puts uh, everyone in the, basically the town in its weakest position because on appeal of a denial, uh, it's almost a, a guarantee that, that the town loses. So the, the question is, what, what does the ZBA do? The ZBA's uh, best course of action, uh, to my understanding, um, is, is to assess the application, uh, apply the four corners of the law, and issue an order with conditions that's the most appropriate. Um, there are issues, uh, maybe I should have mentioned this, Ms. Mohan, so I appreciate your um, question, that are preserved. So for example, the one and a half percent safe harbor status uh, was preserved for further litigation. Um, that probably won't come back up until uh, we're in court. And it's not that abnormal to have um, an unusual situation where you've got multiple appeals from multiple different parties going simultaneously. So it's not necessarily mutually exclusive that the town could, for example, be appealing a decision from the HAC at the same time as an abutter is also appealing a decision from the HAC. I, I hope that provides a little bit more context. I, I know it's 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 a uh, it's it's a uh, there are pieces of it that are that, that, that are quite um, opaque, but uh, you know, does that does that does that make some sense with, uh, in terms of? I just I just want folks to know that again, Tony Whiten is still involved in this process. He's been advising us. Um, the ZBA has to issue a decision, and um, the, the real bind they're in is that the denial of a decision doesn't put them or the town in, in, in a good place. So at some point they have to issue a decision and they have to decide what is what is the best posture we can put ourselves in. And then after that, there's a pretty strong likelihood that there's gonna be appeals by any number of folks. Uh, it doesn't preclude the town from being one of the folks that appeals. I, I, I guess my last point would be, and I wanna hear from my colleagues. I know Mr. DeCourcy and the rest of my colleagues have been active on this is that the select board, previous board of selectmen has taken a very um, uh, ag aggressive stance about what is allowed out there. I understand that Oak Tree is trying to circumvent the process by putting in a 40B. I don't see why, um, and I'd look to attorney Heim, uh, that the uh, zoning board votes what's appropriate I understand 40B, they're trying to trump our, our zoning bylaws and environmental uh, concerns. Why we can't, um, through the zoning board, conservation commission, redevelopment board, or any other commission committee of the town say um, under what is appropriate uh, under our zoning bylaws, what you can put out there. And that's all you can do. Why you haven't done that? My big concern is which I think I just heard again tonight, is that instead of taking what I thought was what the select board had voted on as an aggressive stance um, in opposition to this, we're really kind of hanging our hat on, we're gonna wait until, uh, we're not gonna go to HUD or HAC because uh, they're basically bought and sold and gonna rule against us, which they will, but I don't accept not doing that. It adds more time to the process. We're, we're real, the town strategy is really hanging their hat on um, in a butter uh, appeal in a true co court of law, which I understand you're saying the town can join in on that. 
And if that's our strategy, God help us. I'd like to see uh, more information on that, whether in public session or if it needs to be an executive session. So I'll stop there and I'd like to, to hear any comment from Attorney Heim and then from my colleagues. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess the, the best response I can give is that I think the town has taken uh, the most aggressive posture that it can under the law, because the law is, the 40B law is designed to basically circumvent local zoning. Um, and we've, you know, pretty aggressively been trying to find every way that we can to maintain local control through the safe harbor status and, um, you know, going so far as to, you know, file an action against DMH and DDS to find, to, to force them to comply with HAC subpoenas. So um, I understand it, there's, there's, there's a real uh, dilemma here in the sense that this statutory scheme is designed to wrest local control away from uh, a zoning entity in the town and the sort of forum you have to immediately appeal that result is a forum that is not friendly to municipalities. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I can say that I share your frustration, Ms. Mahan, because, Ms. Mahan, because I agree that uh, there ought to be a process by which the town can maintain more local control than it, than it can, but that, that's, I, I'm not, I'd be happy to uh, arrange for uh, a, co a corroboration of, of the strategic perspective, uh, either with myself or with Attorney Witten, um, to sort of go over um, the options that, that we think we have. Mr. Carroll? Um, dare I even note that we're past 12. Uh, um, you know, my inclination at this hour is along the lines of what you suggested is would be to <clears throat> ask the chair and, and one other member um, as, as chosen by him to work with um, town council and our uh, outside council on an appropriate communication from this board and a concrete recommendation for um, for um, action that we can take or endorse. Okay. That that's all I have right now. Um, it's it's very late. Mrs. Corsi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I and I, I think we have to be mindful that right right now the ZBA is the decision making body that this is in in front of and. Our last letter was July 7th, 2020. The project, the scope of the project has changed since then. That's what has led me among, and, and new information has come in, in terms of um, climate change issues, that there are still questions re regarding environmental. The zoning board has had traffic hearings. They have one more traffic hearing. They have a hearing tomorrow night on the architectural design of the, of the property. And I think it's appropriate for us to send a new letter to the ZBA, recognizing that what we were addressing in the last letter is, is now a different project today. And I, and I think we have to respect their process. They, they have to decide um, that this 40B comprehensive permit application, there's nothing to appeal from, from them. It, it's, they have until April 5th to, um, I believe that's to close the hearing and then 40 days after that, to issue the decision. So I, I do think we've been consistent all along. The town has been consistent since its adoption of a master plan that this area should remain open space. But I, I would support you know, having the chair and attorney Heim work on a letter if one other member wants to, to, to work on it. I'd be happy to, to help out in that effort to update our letter to the ZBA. And, and I think that's, that's the best thing we can do at this point. Um, I have had discussions with, with neighbors have had meetings with neighbors and the neighbors are, 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 have raised their opposition and their concerns and we should continue to do so as a town right now to the ZBA. Mm -hmm. Mr. Diggins. 
Thank you. I mean, well, I definitely agree with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy. And, uh, and um, I guess the only thing I'll add about this is just let's um, be as pragmatic as possible. I mean, we have our principles, we have our goals. I mean, but I mean, in the the face of of opposition, where the odds are low I mean, that you are going to prevail, then you have to take into account the opportunity cost. I mean, of continuing to to fight. You know, uh, uh, but I think um, I, I, I certainly go along with what Mr. DeCourcy has suggested. I mean, and and um, and any more information that uh, that can be provided to us uh, by the, the uh, by Mr. Heim I mean, and and um, the other gentleman, I mean, to the extent that it can be done in a way I mean, that doesn't have us going till one o'clock in the morning at another meeting. I'd appreciate. It. So thank you. <laughs> I say, I mean, the, the the scope of the project has changed, but one thing that's clear from any project presented to us since the beginning of the process is that any development of that site is going to be a disaster. Um, we all know that. I think this board has reiterated that many, many times, and we have a lot of really smart people in town who are reviewing the project on our behalf and just the environmental concerns are through the roof. And so all around, it's just a bad project for the town. I would say Attorney Heim is in a dubious position. I find myself in sometimes as a, a lawyer where you have to look at a situation and look at the practical reality of where you are. And, you know, sometimes we have you get a client that says, you know, I want this result and you, you can't walk backwards from a result. So, I, you know, I think what we're doing, I would support the suggestion as made that we get together and draft another letter that reiterates our opposition and our concerns about the project as presented and continue to assert all legal avenues at, that are available to us to fight the project, but certainly with a practical you know, view of what our legal remedies are. Um, with that, do we have any additional comments? I would move, I'll move for that. So moved. Yep, and uh, Mr. Corsi? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. And Mr. Chairman, there's one other item I want to bring up. I, I, maybe you should bring it up after this. We'll have this motion regarding yep. MUGAR, be very brief. Yep. So I'll, I'll second Mr. Kiro's motion. Any additional comments, Ms. Mann? Um, I'm, I'm not really clear what the motion is. If someone could state it to me. So it's direct me, Attorney Heim, and one other member, which I think Mr. DeCourcy had volunteered for, to update the letter that we drafted in July. To go to? The ZBA. Based on the the uh, the no issue. no that's fine. Um, I'm just going to reiterate again that just from conversations with town officials, it seems, in my opinion, we're hanging our hat on uh, uh, in a butter suit when we get into a real court. Um, and I think that I know I've been going to ZBA and one ARB meeting regarding this, as we all can be going to, um, could we perhaps expand on that? Um, not just hanging our hat on, on the Zoning Board of Appeals ZBA, but also the Conservation Commission that we also send a letter, whether it's the same letter that goes to ZBA or something else that really st states the unanimous um, sentiment of the board. Um, I don't know if Steve, who's also an attorney Johns, who, who's also an attorney, and attorney Heim, who obviously is an attorney, and I'm just my little lowly self, but I'm, I'm just really concerned with what I'm perceiving, not from the board, as sort of some complacency. So, can we expand the motion to not just include ZBA, but Conservation Committee, Conservation Commission, and the Redevelopment Board, which also I've attended hearings on, and we'll have future hearings on that. I'm fine with expanding that motion. I'm fine with expanding it also for um, asking 
the the chair and and town council and and the chairs designate to come back with, with any other recommendations or concrete actions that we might either take or endorse. Okay, I'm fine with that, but I'd like to have a voice in that. I I, I think Mr. DeCourcy should be the other uh, board member on this, but um, I I've been involved in Mugar for close to three decades, and uh, I'd like to have a voice in it. Well, I think I was requesting that they come back to the board with this so that we all Thank have a you. voice in it. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Mr. Diggins? I'm fine. You know, so yeah and and, and I, I i guess i'll say that maybe what you're hearing in my voice you know this is behind isn't so much complacency as much as it is resignation but you know what let's fight the fight you know, as much as we can you know and and uh uh i will um i will i have no further comment i think we're there yeah this is my heart. yes Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. All right, next next item is just add to the agenda. I, I have been oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there, there, there was one oh, other item right, regarding Mugar I wanted to Yep. Go ahead. Then, then, thank you. And and this this follows from a, a, a brief report I had made or that statement that I had made at town meeting regarding the cleanup that, that the Somerville Homeless Coalition had organized in the Mugar Woods back in November. And at the time there was a significant cleanup that was done. And one of the things I said to town meeting is that the cleanup demonstrated the clear need to seek the property owner's participation in future cleanup efforts. And this is completely apart from the proposal um, for the 40B, but there, there, there's a real issue on the site in terms of trash accumulation and removal. And I feel in talking to neighbors and in going to the site, the town manager and I have had some meetings with, with neighbors. We've been on the site. We've had meetings at Thorndike Field and, and there's a real, um, a real issue um, in terms of trash accumulation. And, and I, I really feel that the property owner needs to participate in the cleanup um, of what takes place there. And so what I'm proposing is that we authorize you and the town manager to send a letter to the Mugar family telling them that we wanna meet them, have a meeting at the site to discuss what steps will be taken to clean the trash there. And I, and I wanna make it very clear that we wanna to continue to provide services to the homeless population and, and try to find them shelter. And we want to continue to work with the homeless coalition with our police department and health and human services. However, we feel that we want to make that clear to, to, to Mugar, but we also want to point out that regardless of what happens to that property, um, there's an obligation. It, it, they, they should have an obligation to participate um, in that. And there's, there's dumping that has taken place on that site that beyond the homeless encampment. And I really think it's time to have a meeting with them, tell them what, reiterate what we're doing and ask for their participation. So that's my motion. Second. Any comments, Mr. Diggins? I, I, um, I, I support it. I guess I have a question to um, Tom Council. I mean, um, I mean, to, to, to what ex extent is it the responsibility of the owner to prevent the trash from um, accumulating there versus the town's responsibility to prevent that from happening? Um, as a general matter, uh, I would say that a private property owner is uh, responsible for the condition on their property. Um, the sort of detail that gets difficult is when you've got trespassers on a property um, who are either contributing to a condition, but th that's a longer conversation. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, it, it more offline, if you like, but, but sure. generally speaking, a private property owner is responsible for the condition of the property. As a All right. Fine. Thank you. Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> um, I agree with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy. 
if we could um, send a letter or whatever legal um, notification we can um, to Peter Mugar saying that within seven or whatever days are allowed under law that this situation has to be remedied. If it's not, especially around um, the Mugar site, because contractors have now realized they can dump everything down there. There's the homeless situation, but more importantly, there's also the uh, oil tank and other contractor uh, trash that's being dumped down there. Um, I know I, I put this forth when I've spoken to people in the town and they say we might not get reimbursed and it might cost us eight to 12,000 when we spent millions of dollars on the Coughlin Boris issue. Um, I'd like to investigate um, uh, through Mr. DeCourcy and whoever else, the town manager, that um, whatever Attorney Heim says is the um, shortest window we can give to ask Peter Mugar to clean up that site seven or 10 days. And if not, we clean it up ourselves as well as uh, work with the uh, Board of Health and Police Department in terms of um, communicating and uh, surveying that property, mostly not around the homeless um, issue, but around contractors that now know you can dump oil tanks and up propane tanks and everything down there, that they won't feel as so welcome as to do that anymore. So um, if I could just ask Mr. Corsi to sort of be the purveyor or overseer of that sort of initiative and whatever can come to fruition, I definitely would appreciate. If I could comment, yep. Mr. Chairman, I, and, and I appreciate your comments, Mrs. Mahana. I, I, I think that might be a couple steps away. I, I think the first step is is to call for the meeting down there, have meet them at the site. Um, and, and I know there, there may be a sense of frustration on that, but I, I think given that we still want to provide services on the site, we want to collectively try to address a situation. And I, th I think the first step should be to call for the meeting there with them. And then if they choose not to participate, then we move on from there. But I, 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 I think that I, I, I'm more comfortable with that step in terms of what our posture is and what we want to continue to do there. So I, I, I understand it's years of frustration, but I think we've never really asked to actually meet them there, talk about it, discuss where we're going, and then take next steps if there's no participation. No, 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 I'm fine with that. Uh, that has been done in the past. As someone who's worked on this over 20 years, I'm just saying, can you put a time clock on it? Because they're not going to, Peter Mugar and his aunt, Caroline Mugar, are not going to show up. So if you could put maybe seven, 10 days on it, and then after that, just move forward because they're not going to show up. So it's, you can ask for the meeting. And if you do something different that myself and Clarissa Rowe and George Late and Elsie Fiore, for some reason, were not successful in the past and you are, God bless you. I'm happy with that. But please don't wait more than seven or 10 days when you initiate that. that no, uh, I, and I don't think it should be an open-ended invitation. So I, I agree with you on that on a time frame. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy and Mr. Chair. Yep. And I'm fine with this course of action. I would just note one thing in preparation for this. I did talk to Mike Libby today from the Somerville Homeless Coalition and followed up with a conversation to the town manager. And he had mentioned just in recognition of the SHC that they went out there and they cleaned up a lot of the property and some of the trash that people might be seeing is trash that was cleaned up and put near the front of the property that is waiting to get picked up and town manager can expand if he wants to but I think what we're trying to do and this would be part of this effort is to try to get the home the property owner to hire a private contractor to come and clear that out because it's not the town's responsibility to clean up that much trash and we don't know what type of materials are within it so it is in process and you know I do thank the some of the homeless coalition for the continual e efforts there. Um, and I think that's something that we can tackle as part of this letter when we try to get the Mew guys involved. All right. Do we have a motion? Mr. Carl? 
Well, I think Mr. DeCourcy made the motion yeah, and I DeCourcy, seconded it. Seconded by Mr. Carl. Sorry. It's that hour. That's okay. Hunt. This is Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Yes. So yeah, let's go. Who is this? Oh, sorry. Correspondence received. Resident parking waiver on Whittemore Street. Wait a minute, Mr. Right Chair. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, this one will be quick. Appointment to the, of a designee to the Battle Road 2025 committee. This is a, a committee that I've been attending informally. They're now asking all of the season towns involved to de designate a specific representative from each board to serve on the Battle Road 2025 committee. So I will seek a motion. Mr. Chair, I, if I could, oh, sorry, Mr. Carroll. I, I move to appoint uh, Mr. Hurd to the Battle Road 2025 committee. Mr. Chair, if I could second that. Yep. Mr. Corsi, any comments? No comments. Mr. Diggins, any comments? No. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Vaughn. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Correspondence received resident parking waiver on Whittemore Street, Loretta Mosca, Whittemore Street. Mr. Chair, I move receipt and uh, request that we refer this to the uh, Parking Advisory Committee. Second. Right. Any comments, Mr. Corsi? No comments. Diggins? No comments. Attorney Hyde? This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. New business. Attorney Heim. No new business. Mr. Chaplain. Very quick plug. The Envision Arlington annual townwide survey is available. Uh, please, if you have an opportunity, anybody who's watching <laughs> later, uh, please, uh, it, it's really big help in town planning. Please take the Envision Arlington survey. Thank you. Mr. Diggins? Uh, no new business. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Mr. Curl. Yeah, very quickly. I, I want to acknowledge the um, installation of a new president last week. So congratulations, Mr. Chaplain, on becoming president of the Mass Municipal Association. Um, I also want to just send out, um, I'm sure all of us feel this way, our love and thanks to uh, Ms. Reedy, who has uh, served us so well for so many years. Um, on our staff. Uh, we love you and th thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you around town once we can see anyone around town. Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, um, uh, Governor Baker came out today with uh, uh, information regarding people when you're eligible to get a vaccine, how you find out when you're eligible, where you go to get that. Um, and he directed people to mass.gov uh, slash COVID vaccine. Um, I also want to um, uh, let people know if they go to Arlington's website, arlingtonma.gov, um, and click on COVID-19 or, or, or the Board of Health, there is uh, an online registration um, when Arlington is going to have its own vaccine clinics in, in concert with the state, uh, you can sign up, you, you click in your name, your email, your phone number, and your status, whether it's your age or any comorbidities that you have, and the town um, will retain that information under HIPAA laws and, and the like, um, so it's, it will be kept confidential. But the governor stressed today that uh, the vaccine clinics across the state are going to be sort of a mega capacity site, but also individual community sites. And um, I want to thank our uh, and acknowledge our town manager and our health and human services director, Christine Bongiorno, who are overseeing this. So while I encourage you to go to the state's website, I doubly encourage you to go in terms of vaccine information, eligibility, when is my turn, 
please go to www.arlingtonma.gov to get that information and to sign up, as well as any other of our town departments that can help you out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, um, earlier in tonight's meeting, Mr. Uh, Chapter Lane recognized Mr. Pooler for his uh, fifth anniversary with the town. I want to point out a, um, our board administrator, Mrs. Kropelka, last Tuesday celebrated her 62nd anniversary as a town employee. Um, she began in 1959, and and uh, you read just there's so much knowledge that uh, you know anytime you have a chance to to talk to her about. Um, the various aspects of the job, but uh, but her history with the town and, and the uh, DPW building is is named after Frank O'Hara. She worked for him. The annex at Town Hall, um, the town manager at that time was Mr. Monahan. She worked for him. If you take a ride on the Marquis bike path, she worked for him. Um, and so and she's been our board administrator for so many years. So I happened to be talking to her on the date of her anniversary. I, I wished her well on behalf of the board and, and we appreciate all the work that she does for us and um, the information that that she provides us to, to help our do our job and, and to provide services to the town. So she started working when she was three years old? She was three? That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, that's why they call her the mayor of Arlington. Um, just briefly, I'd laugh because we all say just briefly. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> The um, I just want to acknowledge the MLK committee for the event that they put on on Martin Luther King Day. You know that's an event that we always always look forward to seeing going to and attending each year. Generally, we get to see Mr. Curl up on stage, but next year. Um, but they, they really did put on a very moving event under the circumstances, and you know make made the best of it out of the situation that we're in. So I want to commit can commemorate them. And then um, just acknowledge, we attended the land trust meeting, annual meeting earlier this week, and uh, Bob Wilbur talked about the Tidmarsh Wildlife Sanctuary. It was really an amazing presentation to see the transformation that, you know, a simple investment into conservation of land can do. And we talked about Mugar and that came up a few times. You see the before and after of this area that in Plymouth is was really mind-boggling. So I just thank the land trust for that that uh, presentation. Um, and with that, I believe we'll take a motion. So moved. Move, you... move to adjourn. Yep. Second. All right. Mr. Hand. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Kuro. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. And that's vote. Cheers, folks. Good night.